Welcome back to the Lights Out Podcast. I am the MMA detective, Mike Davis, along with me, Miguel Iterate. Miguel, we've got a very special guest, somebody you might know and have seen live, Marvin Eastman. So, Marvin, you've been around a sport since uh, almost the very beginning years. I think your first fight is in the year 2000, but your journey in combat sports starts much earlier than that. Why don't we talk about your household growing up? What was it like? Um, I come from a pretty athletic and, you know, not to nobody's horn, but everybody in our family was pretty talented, athletic and stuff like that too. And so, um, it was very, very competitive. You just, you come out the box having to be, you know, competition. So, and, um, the expectations were very, very high, just. That was just one of the things that my dad did. He implemented down and uh, and it kind of just trickled down from brother to brother to brother. And 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 I just end up having to be uh, put in that goal. I mean, put in that that gauntlet like that anyway from 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 early, you know. OK, so everybody talks about your brother, Jeff, in regards to like they talk about your athletic accomplishments and the people from the neighborhood go. And Marvin's a specimen. Marvin's yeah. absolutely yeah. his nickname. He's a beast. But his brother Jeff was a comic book character. Like that guy was next level athletic. Is yeah. is, is that kind of who you yeah. have to try to keep up with? Well, my brother Jeff, um, he's the same era as like uh, Marcus Allen, Eric Dickerson, those guys like that. And um, that's the same era that he came up in. And um, he uh, basically, in a nutshell, um, he was late bloomer. Played high school football and stuff like that. And was recruited by everybody, but um, he um, kind of like you know how the Mormons do a, a mission, and um, uh, he started kind of um, learned about Christ and that the athletic career. So he shut everything down in junior college. Recruited by everybody, and he shut it down. And he kind of uh, he went away from the sport for a long time. He's nine years older than me. And then I did high school, and then I get to junior college. My uh, sophomore year, he decides to um, come back and play. So I actually got to play junior college football with my my bigger brother, that was my idol. So um, and he got that exemption because the reason that he stopped playing football is kind of like almost like a Mormon mission, but he wasn't a Mormon. It was Christian based. So that's why his eligibility didn't run out. So I actually got to play junior college football with my brother at the time, you know? So it was, that's, but yeah, he was, but he was doing that, going to college, working. And then after that, he um, joined the police department and became a cop and then a uh, forensic detective. So that's yeah. how he retired as a, a, a forensic detective in California. Marvin, so, so let me ask you a little bit. So you you said he was like Dickerson or Marcus Allen. I'm I remember those guys. So yeah. he was a running back. Yes, Are sir. You, and you were a fullback, so you lined up, you know, together. Like, did you block? Yeah, there? we. Yeah, we both we both played together. I was the. He came back, and I was the featured guy. So. Okay. We both both played together, but I did my first year there as a freshman, and and I, I'm I'm you know had a a really big I accomplished a lot as a high school player, high school football. I ended up making um all American five A in California, and also wrestling in California. So you know you win a state championship wrestling in California, it's a big deal, you know, yeah. because one through five A wrestle against each other. It's not like Nevada. They have it separate. One, two, three, four A. They wrestle uh, separately, but in California, everybody wrestles everybody. One A through five A wrestles everybody. So, um, but I was accomplished. But I was a prop forty eight. So you know that was the route that I would have had to take um, going straight to college. So I went in with the junior college route. You know. So my so, brother. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. What weight class did you win state at in high school for wrestling? One ninety one ninety ones. Okay, that's going to come into play a little bit later. Okay, keep that in mind. That's that's pretty okay. interesting. So, okay. your first fight, King of the Cage, June twenty fourth, two thousand. They put you in a title fight because it's only the fourth King of the Cage. 
but they put you in there with Rampage Jackson. Was there a fight prior to this that you had done, or was this your actual um, first fight in a cage? This was my first fight in a cage because the first the first fight that I had was set up for um, King of the Cage. The guy didn't show up, so um, they paid me because. You know, he came to the weigh-ins and then fight day, he didn't show up. So they actually paid me uh, for the the bout or for the win, for, you know, the win money and stuff like that. It wasn't my fault the guy didn't show up. So so it was, it didn't go on my record, but they paid me for a fight. And then the cool. first actual fight was was Rampage. So they, may, they put you into a title fight. What's interesting is the California scene, yeah, there was that. a lot of, there's a lot of fights like happening in schools that are undocumented. So you didn't take part in any of that. No, no. I was, um, prior to that, you know, I, at the time I was working as a correction officer in Nevada, in North, uh, uh, in Nevada, uh, for the department of corrections here in, in, uh, in Las Vegas. And, uh, so I was actually in full fledged into my career and I was, kickboxing i was i was kickboxing i was doing muay thai and uh and i had about 10 or 11 fights and um basically what happened was is kid cope decided to do um king of the cage and i guess terry treblecock came to one of the uh kickboxing matches that was there and he seen me fight and he said man i would love to have that guy there I just wish he had some wrestling. And Kit says, oh, he was a state champion wrestler here in California. He went undefeated. Um, he was like, oh, man. So then that's how he ended up hooking me up with Terry Treblecock. And uh, hence, King of the Ks, the first fight, no money. I mean, uh, the payoff, but I didn't fight. Then the second fight, it was Rampage. And Rampage had already had five fights. Uh, and he even fought one of my guys that I trained with named Mike Powell. So it's after he would already like five and oh, and I was like brand new. So I had no, I was geared for three minute rounds for Muay Thai, not five minute rounds for the cage. I never fought, but you know, obviously the background of uh, wrestling is most definitely my foundation and Muay Thai just kind of tied it up, you know? So, so how many Muay Thai bouts did you have prior to your first MMA fight? Um, Overall, I had 20 Muay Thai fights. It was 20 and three. And uh, But I didn't know. My, my, my teacher at the time was telling me, <laughs> he's sending me to fight. And he was actually getting paid for them. They were pro. But he was telling me that it was amateur and he was keeping the money. So I didn't find, yeah, no, I, I, I didn't find out until uh, promoters were calling me at the house asking me about the fights and I would go and tell my teacher and he would say, oh, tell him to call me, tell him to call me. So I'm thinking I'm fighting amateur and I'm fighting pro. And then when I would go to the fight and I'd come back, he hand me two or $300 and say, here's gas money. But he was collecting money and he was on, the, they were pro. That hence, and, and it wasn't until I hooked up with Kit Cope that I found out that I was actually fighting pro fights because you don't get paid for amateur fights, you know, but he was giving me three, 400 bucks and people were calling me, but I had no idea that it was actually pro fights. So I had fought, you know, eight or nine fights, you know, it was like, wow, this is crazy. You know, I was doing it because it was fun. You know, it was just, <laughs> I didn't know, you know, so, wow. but anyway. So now, now you go over to... Now you go over to MMA and look, with your background, you got a reasonable idea that you're going to walk in there and be the better athlete in the fight. Oh, yeah. And here's the first fight. Maybe that's questionable. I mean, you're, you play, now in retrospect, you're fighting a stud. How did, how did that feel? Did that come into Future play? World champion. Well, here's a catch. My mentality, I was, when I, the way I was raised, everything, it's like, kind of like an Eastman mentality and it was like can you can imagine you got four older brothers walks in the room and he says the first question you got cousins nieces I mean everything and he says who's the baddest it's like well that's obvious who's the baddest the oldest is the baddest you know but that was one of the things that was posed so 
You don't, we didn't, some, some things just wasn't tolerated, you know? So, you know, my, my, my brother, the way I was taught, my older brother that just died, um, you know, it, it, new kid come in the neighborhood and I'd have to fight him. I'm like, why? He said, because if you don't fight him, you got to fight me. And it's like, okay, well, do I want to fight this guy? I don't want to fight my brother. It was just expected certain things. And you develop a type of mentality that's like, uh, you know, imagine your brother telling you we're Eastman's, we don't take losses, you know? And it's like, damn, I mean, you know, the expectations is high. You know, you can imagine I lost eight wrestling matches in California in my, my career. It was 110, eight and one. My last year, I didn't lose a match. I went 42 and 0. And um, I went 34 and 4 my sophomore year, 34 and 4 my junior year. But, you know, can you imagine you, you smashing everybody and you got your brother in there yelling because you didn't pin everybody? You just beat everybody, you know? But that's the kind of mentality that I loved him. He made me hella tough. But trust me when I tell you, um, my, my, my upbringing was. You know, I always wrestled at a higher level. Matter of fact, when I was in Pop Warner, eighth grade, I mean, a, a fifth, sixth grade, I didn't wrestle at the elementary. I wrestled for for the uh, middle school. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm okay. in the third grade, fourth grade, and, my, and I they brought me up, and I wrestled for the middle school. I didn't wrestle uh, at my level. I wrestled above playing football. Same thing. I always wrestled. I mean, I played football at a higher level. It's, it was just the way they did. They snuck me in to do something. So, you know, okay. it's just the way I was raised, you know, okay. but so it sounds it's like a higher was, house. I think, yeah, I think it's hard for discipline. That sounds like you grew up disciplined, you know? Yeah, you do. But imagine this, imagine when growing up with a mentality, like, um, where everybody expects you to be able to do whatever. If I say, you know, I can only jump nine feet, but my brother says, you got to dunk at 10 feet. And guess what? That's expected of you. And then your mentality comes where everybody expects you to do more than what you do. So eventually you start to develop that type of mentality. So you don't, there's nothing that you don't think you can accomplish. So there's got to be some time where somebody tells you, hey, that's enough. Turn it off. Well, when your own mentality is like, Hey, um, I gotta do it. I gotta do it. I gotta do it. You, you, you won't even give yourself a break because the expectations is so high. Um, it can be a curse and it can be a, a, a good thing. It'd be a curse. It's be a curse because you don't know when to turn it off or you can't turn it off, but it can be a good thing. Cause it always pushes you to go the hardest as you possibly can, you know? So, um, I respect it. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, let's talk about Rampage. Going into that fight, did you have any idea of how large mixed martial arts was going to be involved with yourself at that point? No, I didn't. And the reason why is because to me, it was just fun. It was extra money on the side. I didn't look at it. I just was doing something. Everybody could lift weights. Everybody could do this or this, but it took something special to be able to kick box and do that and then hold a full-time job. You know, um, for me, that winning that fight uh, and I win all the rest of the fights, that's when King of the Cage was hooked up with Pride. They offered me a five-fight contract to go fight uh, in Pride. Well, I just start working as a, uh, a full-time officer with the North Las Vegas Police Department. So I'm on probation, so I can't take this contract to go fight in pride. So I won and uh, they offered me a contract again. First, they offered to the Mike Bork. Mike Bork uh, fought um, the Japanese guy. I can't remember what his name is. Then he lost. And then they offered to me again. And I couldn't take it because of uh, the obligation of being over the, with the probation. So they offered it to Rampage, and Rampage had uh, some warrants in Memphis. He got the warrants taken care of, and then he took the contract, so he went to Pride instead of me. Okay, so let me kind of, every people that follow our podcast, if you guys listen to the Brian Gary interview, this is when Rampage gets pulled off the plane. He thinks Chris Brennan sets him up, and, you know, he doesn't get the fight. It's kind of a crazy situation. Rampage is a unique individual. This is the beginning of that story. Okay, so 
Rampage gets the contract. That fight between you two was insane. Like for that being your first fight, and him is like probably a six. Like you've yeah. got some foundation at six fights, but your first fight, you still got butterflies and adrenaline dump. You didn't give an inch. No, because honestly, to me, I mean, I'm just keeping it real. You got to go in there with a med- mentality like this dude's trying to take my head off. I don't give a damn who shows up. King Kong, I'm a, I don't give a damn. It's, that's the mentality that I have. But you got to realize this. Do you realize I was on probation at the police department. I was a probationary officer. I took that fight. Do you know after that fight on a Saturday, Sunday morning, I had to be back to work. Oh, you know, man. I went to work with a broken foot. Um, if you look in that fight, I was kicking him in the legs. He rotated to the left when I kicked him, and I kicked his knee, and it broke uh, one of the metatarsals in my foot. And I ended up fighting and doing my thing, but the next morning, oh, it blew up. Uh, I had to be back to work. So you know what I did? I taped it up, put on a couple of uh, ankle braces and my boots on, and I went back to work. I, I didn't, I didn't get a like a lot of people don't know. All those years that I fought. I had a full-time job as an officer. So any cuts, anything, any injuries that I got, they didn't give me time off. I had to go right back to work. I just completed my um, 25 years as an officer in 2017, but I did that all the way through my career. I, I, I worked full-time. So when guys were, I'm training jujitsu in the morning, two hours, going to UNLV, boxing for two hours, and then leaving there, and going to train Muay Thai for an hour and a half, come home, take a shower, and I go back to work. I did that for 16 years. So when well, guys wait, wait, to- wait, let's talk about mandatory overtime too. Sometimes yes, you're sir. forced to work yes, overtime. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A hundred percent. And I work in a, we had a federal contract. So we worked for I- INS Bureau of Prison, um, DEA, FBI. We had a contract with them. So sometimes we work, Overtime, I'd work 15 hours, and guess what? I wasn't going home. Skip Kelp, which is my coach, he would yeah. say, get your stuff on, come to the gym. You're going to train with me for one hour, and then you go home and go to sleep. Well, I've already worked 15 hours. It takes an hour to drive. You drive, oh. you train with him another hour. Guess what? You're sleeping one hour, two hours going back to work. I slept yeah. on my breaks. I did that. I did that for 17 years. So when I got that cut on my face from Rampage, I mean, when I got that cut on my face from Vitor Belfort, guess what I had to do? I had to show back up in two days and go back to work with that big cut on my forehead. I didn't get a break. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I, I got a question for you. Now, looking back at it, there was a pride contract. Now, a lot of guys might have been blinded by that and said, yeah, I'm going to pursue my dream or, you know, I'm tough enough or, and taking that contract. You said you turned it down. It, and now you 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 put 25 years in the force, so you took the stability, which – but how do you think about it? Do you ever think I should have taken that contract? No. Okay. I could tell you Good. what. If, Good for if, you, man. If, Good if for we, you. The reason why I say that is is because the problem now is – okay, the difference is look at the uh, uh, how the sport has evolved. They had thousandaires and a couple of hundred thousand heirs when I first started. Sure. They got millionaires now. Different ball game. The money, the, the, most, the most money I ever made fighting in my career was five figures. Now, yeah. had I won that fight against Vitor, he yeah, has a six-figure uh, contract that you signed. But do you know that fight only made $10,000 for that Vitor Belfort fight? Yeah. So... So now you fight for the title. Now that ten thousand turns into a hundred thousand. Man, these guys are making a hundred thousand like nothing now. You get fight at night, bonuses at night. You make a hundred, hundred fifty thousand, two hundred thousand like that. But come on, think about this: fighting for the belt for a hundred thousand. I only made ten thousand fighting a uh, uh, fighting Vitor for that fight. Now it jumps up to a hundred thousand. But we talking different. about. 2003, 2004, those cats make that. They make that like nothing. So why yeah. would I turn down a guaranteed six-figure income as, a, as, a, as an officer for $10,000 or $15,000 that you only get every so often? They don't They don't have the endorsements. I, w- I had, um, what is, you know, you had sponsorships, you have this. I, I was, a, you know, 
tap out was started and um I forget the name of the the sponsor that um there was a startup company when I started it was um um they got the s the symbol was the s um it was he was oh my god what is it called um spider it's spider's big sponsorship huh Strong? Um, you know, uh, Anderson, Anderson's the Spider Silva. It was a startup company with okay, them. You got um, Silver Star. You got Sprawl. Those are only two S's that I'm going to come up with. Either way. I yeah. Think anyway, Silver but Star was in uh, Anderson. Um, I, I'm I'm blowing a brink. But anyway, they were. It was a quite a few little companies, and they didn't even have any money. But then they eventually all this stuff started popping up later on. Um, but uh, like I said, the money wasn't really big enough for me to do that at the time you know what i'm saying so you know now i got a punch in this coming for the rest of my life and the guys that didn't keep their money you know they're working you know i had an individual i won't put them on blast but they called me a while ago and hey marv you got any hookup to be a cop or i'm like the hell uh you don't want to start this this late in your career now it's a good dude but hell i'm i'm retired why would you want to i don't want to be on the street policing and doing that kind no. of stuff right now hell they got a different way that they do stuff so it's tier two you don't want any part of that man hell no no bueno no. man you know so well here let's let's kind of kind of wrap it back around um okay. master toddy was in your corner the muay thai how long have you been training with him up until your first fight um well actually i trained with master toddy but master chan his uh his second in command was the guy that actually literally trained me, trained me, trained me personally. He had came from England and he didn't speak English good. So they kind of, he had all the other pros and I was kind of like the developmental guy. So I actually grew up and I was trained by master Chan all the way through until I finished up my career. But, um, but yeah, it was master tidy. It's his tutelage. So I teach, that's the way I teach, the old school Muay Thai, not all this calf kicking and garbage that they don't that they do. That's a fad. That's not Muay Thai. Um, I mean the real. It's just like I'm when I tell people, I said there's 16 ways to strike with the elbow. It's it's traditional. I've been taught like that. So, you know, um, but it's authentic. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of the everything is modernized. They change. There's certain things that just doesn't change, and the game has changed a lot. You know, but. Um, okay. Yeah, it, right. it looks like they're looking for a lot of shortcuts nowadays. Yes, now, sir. Now let me ask you, you you mentioned Skip Kelp too. Now Skipper, he's a uh he was a national amateur boxing team member, you know, but yes, back sir. in the eighties and stuff like that. Why don't you yeah, talk about training yeah. with him? Um Skip is my boy. Um uh and I hooked up with him through John Lewis. Um, yeah. initially, yeah, JSEC. Initially, John was my my mentor, my trainer, and he's the one that after I hooked up with um, fought Rampage. Terry Treblecock is the one that recommended. He wanted me to. He, I was under contract with him, so he recommended. He said, "Look, I'm gonna send you to a guy down in Vegas so you can have a gym to go to because I want you to start training like this." He said, "Okay." So what he did is he paid. John Lewis, a thousand dollars. And back then you couldn't just join a gym. You had to be initiated in. So what I did is John Lewis was the only school here. So I showed up and the first thing they did is they put me in the cage. It was me, Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell, Eric Pele, uh, oh. um, um, Tony D'Souza and, um, um, Mark Lehman, that was my initiation. And basically wow. what we did is we got in a cage and they said, okay, we're going to do takedowns. I'm like, I don't, I don't know who these people is. And I'm, I'm a savage. So I don't give a sh So it was takedown. So I'm double egg and taking Tito down, taking Chuck down, taking these guys down. That was my initiation. You know, we doing, we doing, we're wrestling. So that's what he did. You couldn't just walk into the gym and join. I had to go and figure out whether or not it was good. That's what I did, man, yeah. with Chuck. Doing takedowns, doing takedowns with Tito back and forth. And, okay, you 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 in the game. And that's how I got hooked up. So 
that's that's how we started. You just didn't walk. You walk into a gym and it's like, hey, I want to train. OK, you, you pay your money and you train. Hell no. You had to get initiated. So and being that JSEC was the first MMA gym here in, in Vegas, that's where you had to go through. So Chen yeah. Lewis was way ahead of his time as compared to everybody else. Like his vision was much bigger than probably about 99 percent of the mixed martial oh, arts. Yeah. Community yeah. 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 Most definitely. John Lewis is John Lewis, the concept with the WFA and all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that they're doing. I can tell you this, um, you know how they got the ultimate fighter and stuff like that, man, John Lewis initiated and started all that stuff before the UFC had that stuff. John Lewis did a reality show with A&E where they did a, um, audition for people in new york on the on the east coast and what it did is whoever won that competition got to come down to vegas and train with john lewis learning how to be a professional fighter like the, the beginning of uh the ultimate fighter um and so we started that and but one of the things that you had to do with that person who made it was they had to wrestle with me initially, and then they had to go stand up with um, <laughs> Gilbert Ivell. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> the guy didn't even get to me. Gilbert Ivell touched the guy up so bad on A and E. He beat him up so bad the dude left and took a plane ticket and and, and went back to <laughs> went back to to uh, the Arizona. I mean, he went back to New York. But but basically, in a nutshell, all the that stuff, the fight with the nightclub, all that stuff, man, it's, it's John Lewis. John Lewis is the, pretty much the pioneer of all that stuff. He just, you know, sometimes you can have the vision, but, but sometimes you need to le let somebody else run the business part, you know? So yeah. you'll be ahead of your time, too, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. most definitely. Most yeah. definitely. That, that's, that's actually you, a big problem. You keep in touch with John, Mark? You're sad? You keep in touch with John? Yeah, John, um, John, I know he's I working talking. for like a space company. He wants it's space entertainment. He wants to be yes. the first person that does fighting in space. Oh, that's crazy. Well, <laughs> my, that's my that's my boy. He's doing his movies and doing his stuff on the time. And I because my gym just opened up and and our our lineage is John Lewis, Nova Uno, Jiu Jitsu. Um, I've been, um, you know, sticking to the course and we're. St st and so I'm doing my affiliation with. You know, so I'm linked in Nova Unia Jiu Jitsu. That's what we're teaching here, but we're teaching catch can. Um, a lot of people don't really understand that submission catch can. So we're staying with the Nova Unia, the brand. And then, you know, the Muay Thai that I teach is, is Master Stott, Master Tati based. But it's just, you know, it's my touch with Skip Kelp and all that other kind of stuff. I keep it traditional. And, uh, you know, the guys that we got here, one of my guys, protege name is uh, um, David Jordan. His nickname is KO because he, he's knocking everybody out. And uh, I mean, one hitters, not one, two, three, four, five. We talk about one hit. Um, he he, and I hate no nobody, but he retired a a, a lead trainer from a, a a prominent school here with one hit, put him to sleep, broke his jaw and put him to sleep. He'd been putting everybody to sleep, and uh, but. Little injuries is keeping him from being on the uh, being able to stay on point. We can get back on point. And he's doing his thing, but his nickname he'd is be good at burn uncle. He'd huh? be good at burn uncle. Oh, trust me when I tell you. If yeah. you see some of the fights, it ain't been. I know who he is. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know who he is. Okay. He'd be good at BKFC. <laughs> okay. Well, here you win the title. They're, King of the Cage is such a new organization. They don't even have a belt yet. They're giving no. trophies away. For the right. title holders, right. right? You pull in with Big Joe Loca Tiuna out of out of Hawaii. <clears throat> Eddie Bravo said this guy's making his professional debut, but he's fought several of my friends in closed door gym fights. So it just kind of tells you that the scene in LA is, in, or in California, right. is a lot right. different than a lot of other parts of the country. Right. After your second fight, what's interesting is that Randy Couture is scheduled to fight. Uh, Kevin Randleman at UFC 28, and he pulls you in for a camp. Was that in Vegas, or did you go out to Oregon? No, it was it was here. It was here in Vegas. 
So he came down there. What was that like training with him? Um, <laughs> trying to be cool without putting anybody on issue. For me, I, I, I'm not. I've never been a person, and I'm not hating on anybody, but I've never been just starstruck by anybody. So to me, when you come and you compete in the same thing, I don't. I never really looked at anybody like. Oh, you, there's your dear to your accomplices. Like, I, I give you respect, but the bottom line is when we go in the cage, nobody respects anybody. You 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 go and you do your thing. So kind of what happened was uh I go over there and I'm training with them and uh we kind of doing our thing and I'm Muay tying him a little bit. And I know he's a Greco guy, so and I'm a I'm a freestyle guy, so um I'm kind of touching his legs a little bit. And uh, he kind of didn't really particularly care for me killing his legs with the leg kicks. And uh, so he um, <laughs> he got I'm killing his legs. Huh? He got I'm, upset. I'm trying, to be, I'm trying to be respectful, but I'm kind of killing his legs. And he kind of gets a little bit irritated. So he, he kind of... Uh, kind of kicked me in the gonads a little bit, kind of, uh, so we kind of, you know, have a standoff a little bit, and then we go and we touch up each other a little bit, but I know he's a Greco guy, so you don't tamp, you don't stand up with a Greco guy. You give him angles, and and uh, because, they, you know, if they get chest to chest with you, they're going to throw you. I'm, I'm a wrestler. I'm a freestyle guy, so, you know, I'm giving him angles and going and going for takedowns and stuff, and we just kind of neutralized each other, and that was the only time that I ever um, trained with him. But but he, he kind of didn't really like that I kept killing his legs. I was tearing his legs up pretty bad, and I think he, he what he should have did is basically said, hey, don't don't kick my legs if you don't want me to. But I was beating his legs up pretty bad, so he kind of kicked me in the balls, and that kind of started us a little bit down the down road, and I think we did a couple more rounds, and that was it, you know. But, <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> That's all right. Okay. So one of the most legendary King of the Cage events is when there was a torrential downpour happening. <laughs> and that was uh, King of the Cage Wet and Wild, February 24th, 2001. You fought Floyd Sward on that. Right. right. Okay. C could you bring us through exactly why they even allowed that event to continue? Because of all the people from Pride. They had so many people that came. They had all those Japanese representatives and all this other kind of stuff here. It was everybody. Sakuraba, that's his name. Sakuraba. They had all oh. that that um the the legendary guy that with the kind of big chinness of Inoki. Uh, yeah, Inoki. All those all those guys were there, so they had to put the event on. But here's the thing: I'm a stand-up guy. That's a wrestler, and you got vinyl. You got a vinyl surface. It was horrible. It was horrible. So I'm going with him, trying to keep my my my, my balance. We fall, I fall into his guard. The dude puts a triangle choke on me, and he has me in a triangle choke for four minutes. <laughs> and, and he's and he's hitting me in the head with his knuckle. And really, any other way he should have finished me. The only way I was able to survive his triangle choke is because I pushed him up against the fence, and I would stick my toe in the mat and that was the way I got I, I was able to not get choked out because he he anybody else within that surface he should have choked me but he couldn't engage it all the way because it was too slippery for him to be able to finish me so he just punched me in the face for four minutes in a triangle and I, all I could do is sit there and take it then the next round we just we slip her in I just peppered him up standing up but honestly <laughs> that was it was horrible conditions and he he probably anywhere any other place he probably should have finished me because but you couldn't grip but then he probably would have never got me in a triangle because it was so slippery you know that was the way he was able to get it you know but terrible so, outdoor event torrential rain guys what was the what was the talk in the locker room like no 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 the event's not canceled you're you're still fighting yes sir that was that was exactly because they had all the people represented in Japan so they you, you 
you can't have all those people come over here and you not fight. So they did it. And I'm like, man, I probably that's what I do it the point. next day. Huh? What'd you do with the I, I mean the next day? It was on an Indian reservation. Oh my God. Yes, yeah, but they they didn't do it. They they went ahead and ran it. I was like, what the hell? Now, maybe it had been the surface like the UFC. Um that yeah, it would have been okay, but that thing would have been soaked. But hell, vinyl, that was like a slip and slide, bro. You know, yeah. like you use a awesome. kid. So Absolutely yeah, it was awesome. terrible. Terrible. And I actually that should have been, it could have been my damn first loss because I, you know, no way in the world, nobody pretty nobody fought good in that that thing. It was crazy. Yeah. So well, very important part of, of mixed martial arts is learning from that first loss on April 29, 2001. You fight King of the Cage, I guess, legend, uh, Vernon Tiger White, somebody that you've uh, had a few fights with. Uh, this is your first one, though. Um, yeah. Big guy coming out of Lion's Den, big reputation. I mean, lots of fights in Japan. What are your thoughts yeah. heading into this? Um, To me, it's my mentality is like, I, excuse the French, I don't really give a damn who shows up. I'm smashing everybody. That's so us. So I had no no concept of the lion's den or anybody from that camp, but he had more experience to me. But one thing that was very, very interesting, he was Taekwondo kind of whatever. And I'm Muay Thai and wrestling. You realize um, that was my fourth fight and it was for a title. And um, he kicked me in the first round. He kicked me in the groin and it broke my tie cup. Ooh. It broke it in half. It broke the cup in half, and uh, they gave me a 15-minute break because it was a title fight. And, uh, I mean, I'm telling you, a tie cup. He kicked it, and he broke it in half. It was not plastic. It was a the tie cup. It broke it in half. I ended up having a, finishing up the fight. Needs to say I lost the decision, but... Split, split decision. I, yeah, and the, the funny thing was, is um, I couldn't sleep with underwear on for a week. Um, <laughs> literally, I mean, I couldn't because it. I don't know what it does to your groin, but it swelled the <laughs> testicles up, and I was raggedy for a whole week, man. You know what I'm saying? And but. But, yeah, I mean, who gives you a 15-minute break so you can continue? Most guys get kicked and they say it's a wrap. It's not. But it was a title fight, so I had to do it. I got I got talked into doing it by John Lewis um, because it was the first opportunity to fight for, for a championship. But trust me, like I said, going back to the gym, going back to the police department with blue balls, you can't wear underwear. It's not a good look, you know. So sometimes oh, when I see people get kicked in the balls, I'm like, man, really? <laughs> I, I laugh because – who who breaks the cup? You know, you know yeah. that, that's serious. Well, yeah. And you mentioned who gets 15 minute breaks. Organizations that don't have sanctioning bodies get 15 right. minute breaks. You're right. That, that's you're who right. does that, man. You're, you're right. You're right. That was the good old days. Um, you lose a split decision to Vernon White. You got to get back on the horse. John Lewis comes with World Fighting Alliance One, which is a very cutting edge mixed martial art organization with some incredible matchmaking. And he puts you in with future world champion Rich Franklin. So keep in mind, we're we're going to count Vernon White as a world champion. This is your third world champion, and you've got under ten fights. Um, we with that, it's kind of crappy because anybody knows that when somebody goes for an armbar. The first thing you, you you post up and you have to, you know, when you get the arm bar, the person who's engaged in the arm bar turns your thumb out. And when you turn the thumb out, it doesn't allow the person to spin and come out the back door. It uh, You can't turn against it because when you try to pull out, uh, you go against the natural way that your arm rotates so you can't get out. Well, I can't remember Larry Landless. I think that's his name. He's not even roughing anymore. Um, I'm going with him. I double leg him, slam him, get him to the cage. He goes for an arm bar. 
I spin out the back door like he's supposed to. You have to put your hand down to rotate out. It's kind of like if somebody goes for an, uh, uh, a knee bar I mean, or a heel hook. You know what you do is if they don't get your heel, if you if your heel is not turned out, you can rotate your foot and come out the back door. Well, that's exactly what I did. I rotated out, pulled my arm out, and when I hit the ground, he called a tap. So I'm like, man, that's BS. It's BS. It wasn't a tap. That's how you get out. So um, what they do is say, okay, we're going to run it back. Well, needless to say, Rich Franklin don't want to run it back. He 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 doesn't do it. So um, he leaves, and then he, he doesn't fight in the WFA anymore. So never got opportunity to actually, you know, rectify that. But – but I didn't tap. It's just you know, if you know anybody, like I said, you that's how you get out. You you turn the way the opposite. You turn the way that he's trying to rotate your arm, and you that's how you come out. Um, so anyway, um, you know, stuff happens. You know, whatever. Well, it, it's a fight game. You know, on paper, Rich is he's a kickboxing guy. You're a Muay Thai guy. On paper, that that fight's got fireworks written all over it. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. But, you know, the question is, I don't know him. He doesn't know me. And like I said, to me, I'm not in that game. I mean, if anybody, if you go into a fight as a respecter of persons, you've already you've already did yourself a disservice and you won't fight. You can't. I can respect you out of the ring, but in the ring. No fighter, if you come in there and you have respect for that person, you're going to hold back. I wouldn't give a damn who the hell shows up. I'm trying to tear your damn head off yeah. because that's what you're supposed to do. And then afterwards, if you drink beer, you drink beer. I'll get a Gatorade or some Mountain Dew and I drink and I'll watch you drink. <laughs> that's that's what you're going to get for me. But but before that, like I said, do you think Rampage ain't trying to tear my head off when we go in there? But guess what? We're cool outside of the ring. That's what you're supposed to do. you know. And um, if you fight with respect in the ring, you put yourself in a situation where you could be nah, – I don't mean like disrespect, but I mean you don't care who shows up. That's what I mean. You, you, right? You've already lost. If you come in there with too yes, much yes, respect, you've already yes, lost. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, no, for sure. For sure. Who was the matchmaker for the WFAs? Um, oh, my God. It wasn't Peretti, was it? No. Um, He owns – RFA and LFA. I don't care that that he was a uh, um, Marco Soros. Yep. Okay. Wow. He did a really good job on those. Yeah. Man, Marco's been around a long time. That's that's wild. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. We'll owes me some money, but we'll move on. Yeah. World Fighting Alliance. Then you fight Tommy Sauer. You bounce back with some elbows, and you make a huge statement in K one. What? Yeah, I'm on listening August, to you. On I'm August listening. 17th, or on August 17th, 2002, you make a huge statement in Las Vegas. You beat Duke Rufus in a K1 of that. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah, because he's a world champion. So you beat Duke Rufus in a K1 event in Las Vegas, another world champion. That's a huge staple. Yeah. Um. First time um well here's the crazy thing after when i first fought rampage the k1 was trying to get me to fight for them but after i found out that the teacher was sending me to fight professional fights and calling it amateur what i did is i said okay i'm gonna let john lewis manage me as an mma fighter and i'll let you manage the kickboxing side um, initially he was okay with it. And then what he did is he said, no, that's cool. And what he did is he kicked me out the gym. So yeah, he, he, he they, I got kicked out of master toddies cause I didn't manage anymore. So, but they had tried to come after me then to, to sign with the K1 at that time. I didn't do it. And then eventually when I got with Skip and doing my thing later on, then I ended up getting an opportunity to fight with, um, because um, the the owner or the manager, the owner of uh, Bellator, it was the the guy who ran everything. What's his name? Um, 
It's Bjorn yeah. Rebney at the time. No, no, no. He, no, uh, yeah, but well, no. Coker. The guy. You talk about Scott Coker, Coker or Bjorn Scott Rebney? Scott Coker. Scott Coker. Okay. Yeah. So, um, kickboxing guy. I can same see thing. I didn't know. I mean, I didn't, excuse the French, uh, I, I didn't give two rats asses about who the hell, uh, Duke Rufus was, and it's not disrespect. You just you just have to come in there like I'm not a respecter of persons. When you come in, whoever you fight, you just come in and you do what you got to do. And it's not disrespect that it's not cocky. You just say, hey, I don't give a damn who shows up. I'm smashing you. If you beat me, okay. But but my mentality my mentality is already geared to 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 destroy whoever shows up. So. Yeah, I knew I knew about Rick Rufus and his brother Duke Rufus and all that kind of stuff. And he kind of it's kind of a crazy story behind that too, because about three or four years ago, Kevin Holland comes into um <laughs> syndicate. <laughs> and uh and I'm already retired. I ain't even fighting, you know, doing my thing. And he's over there and we're sparring and we're doing our thing, and he starts sparring with me. But he's running around and he's not training. He, he, he's he's fighting like he does in the cage, you know, talking and smack all this kind of kind of figure out like, man, why are you being disrespectful, dude? I don't even know who the hell you are. So uh, we kind of got into it, and my 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 junior, my 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 third, the third Marvin, the third was like, man, I beat the brakes off of you, dude. So he for disrespecting me. So my my little my son is a he fights at 45, but he's been doing Muay Thai and wrestling for multiple years. He gets in with it, and he, I guess he was pissed off, and he touched Holland up something fierce. But he was mad at, he was mad because, I found out later, he was mad because I knocked out his trainer. I'm like, dude, it was, it was a, it was competition. Why are you trying to get, get back for something? There was nothing between me and Duke Rufus. It was, it was competition, you know, but you trying to, get me in sparring because I knocked out your trainer. I'm like, well, what about the people? I lost a rampage. You go, somebody going to be mad at me because you training with rampage and rampage beat me by knockout. Come on. Really? But yeah, but, but anyway, that, I mean, he really tried to, he tried to touch me up in sparring because of Duke Rufus. Cause I, cause I knocked his trainer out. Like, wow. Okay. Something wrong with you, dude. You know, so, but anyway, One of those feuds that goes back about 300 years ago. They disrespect you right now. My grandfather. <laughs> Yes, sir. It's crazy. Crazy. Well, you beat Duke Rufus, which is a huge statement. And you're back to MMA, where I think you were supposed to fight. It was WFA3. Were you supposed to fight one of the Machados? Um, yes. And uh, I think it was a money thing. Okay. Um, uh, because I think one of the things was with John... He was trying to um, trying to put his stuff on the map, so trying to get a lot of names. Like for instance, like you remember, uh, he had Alistair Overeem. Yeah. Uh, 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 he was trying to get Valentino. You know, no, he had yeah Valentino, the brother. So all the guys, he was trying to get the name people, and they were name in the community, but they wasn't really. You got to have a name here in the states. So, so some of the people. Um, it's too early. It was too early. Yes. yes. So, that's hence. Like he um, knew who they were. It just yes. no one else did. Yes. Yes. In the in the community, we knew who they were, but and you know, of course they're going to command some money because they're known over there. So they come over here, they think the same thing. UFW Faye didn't have the money at the time. The concept and stuff was great. He should have kept it little bit lower profile because it it attracted and it did all this stuff but unfortunately they didn't have the, the money to keep it rolling like but the concept was awesome so yeah, yeah that's hence that's how we end up being alex, alex stevling alex stevling so at this time alex stevling he's known as the brazilian killer we did an interview with him it's a fantastic listen and he got that moniker so he could fight everybody in brazil because that was his goal to be the baddest yes. man in the world yes and you guys touched base on november 23rd 2002 how'd that one go um like i said the same thing i didn't know anyone and i don't disrespect i've never been some people can sell their tickets and sell their brand 
by talking smack. Um, I love Tito. Tito, my dog. You know, Tito, blah, 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 whatever. You know, and then you got um, the wrestler that's chill, chill, Sona, and they talk. All these guys talk and they sell their tickets. One thing about talking a lot is if you don't perform, you look stupid. But if you can talk the talk and walk the walk, so be it. To me, a lot of that persona, a lot of that kind of stuff, you got to realize this. And here's what it is. I'm not a braggart. I'm not that person. It's not who I am. Now, if you piss me off, I'm a man. I'm going to get at you like a man. Um, But the guy came in with this name. He's killing all these Brazilians. And we had the press conference, and he comes in with this hype. And he and I don't disrespect nobody. And the worst thing you can do is call a man a bitch. Well, well hold up. Especially where you work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, like you're, it's actually a little hypersensitized just based yes, sir. on working at the jail. Like, yes, that's, sir. That's it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So... He comes in and, he, you know, he's coming with this hype and he, ah, Marvin, he's, he's a bitch. I'm like, what? You're going to disrespect me like that, homie? And I was like, yeah, okay. So we do our interview and we do our stuff pre-game. I said, man, look, and I, my my conditioning and my shape was ridiculous at the time. So I, I said it in my, my warm-up. I was like, you know, this dude come in here and he called me a bitch. And I was like, he talked with his hands. I talk with my fist. And it was a short night for him because, you know, he, he got turned around and it was like my first world championship that I actually won, you know, and I, but I was, I was, I was kind of, I don't, I try not to fight piss, but I think it was more so uh, just the disrespect, you know? So I, I turned his chin around pretty, pretty good, you know? And, it's, you know, you mean you can talk smack before, but then afterwards everything is done. It ain't a lifelong thing, but but that's what it was. But yeah, it was my first championship, and it was, it was I was very very happy and about Did it. You shake hands with him afterward. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a lot of a lot of fights that I had that could have made made me a bigger a, a a big name. Didn't fight on TV. You know, I got some some fights. For some reason, the UFC just had. I just had the worst luck fighting in the UFC. Just every time, five fights, and I had one time that I fought that there wasn't something. Uh, uh, one time that that I fought that I didn't have something wrong. Every other time there was some major issue. Well, I mean, I'm talking about major. We'll get into that. We'll get into okay. that. Okay. Okay. So you got Vitor Belfort. It's it's unfortunate. You talked about the UFC curse. Uh, Vitor Belfort landed a knee. It opened up a huge gash on your head. Some argue that it's one of the worst cuts in UFC history. Uh, you waiting for a response? Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, okay. you had to go to work the next day. Yeah. Um, I'm training with all my guys. Dewey Cooper, which is a world champion. All these guys we were doing our thing there's really no excuse when you fight no ifs ands and buts about it but i work at a police department and also at the time my how do i say it? my fiance at the time that i have kids by um works there too. She's an officer too. So that's rough. Yeah. But um needless to say, um, we're both supervised by the same person. And I find out that week that the supervisor is having an affair, three year affair with my fiance. I hate to say this. That's kind of the job, man. Like it's, it's, it's well, not uncommon to work like that. No, it, it it's it's not because most people, when you got a professional fighter, that all you do is knock people out for a living, 
ain't stupid enough to shit that's, where they eat. That's different. So therefore, that's different. so so therefore, you know what you do? How you disguise it? You act like you don't like each other. Nothing. You understand? Oh, so man. if you don't like each other, then there's no there's 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 nothing to speculate about. So you you find out the week of the fight and where you think my mind was yeah, the night no, of the fight. Anywhere except where it's supposed to be. Yeah. yeah you therefore lost the fight already. You should can't you should have canceled it. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know. But yeah, but think about this. I got it's a pay-per-view fight. I got my whole department fighting. And two days before that, I find out my supervisors has been having a relationship with my with my fiance for three years. So now she says, he calls me on the phone and says, hey, I've been kicking it with her for three and a half years. I just wanted to let you know. And I said, he's, and he said, I told her she has to make a choice, him or me. That's what I found out the day before my fight. Now imagine going Ugh. into a fight like that. Wow, well, shit. And sounds like you got round two the next day. Well, I can tell you this. Had what I planned to do had happened, you'd be interviewing me from the penitentiary. Oh, because, because I was going to be a two-time murderer because that's what my plan was. And no. the, the only thing that kept me from being in prison is the fact that I have a background that's uh, based in, in church. And I have a mother that's a prayer warrior and my uncle is a, um, is a minister. But I planned on committing murder the next week. And I'm talking about, I'm committed. not, I'm talking about walking yeah. into the police station for briefing and not taking off my weapon and shooting both of them and killing them in briefing. And I'm telling you the honest to God truth, I was going to be a double murderer because that's how I found out. I got embarrassed on national TV, on pay-per-view TV, and everybody's looking and nobody has no idea why I got my head. Now, if I'd lost to Vitor Belfort, now you got to remember, I'm a wrestler. I'm a wrestler. I'm a wrestler. When do you don't, when, when do you stop on a shot? That's all I do. Yeah. That's all I do is shoot. Do you realize I I got scholarship offers from high school. I was going to go wrestle in Kansas by way of Oklahoma. I didn't have the grades. But so I'm a wrestler by heart. People think I'm a kickboxer. I'm not a kickboxer. No. I'm a wrestler that learned how to kickbox. So shooting is something that I do all the time. So who hesitates on a shot? So Man. you don't you understand what I'm saying? You don't think, you react. When you think it's too late, you have to shoot by reaction. Your shot is reaction. It's not thinking, it's reacting. Yeah, it's it, you know, it's what you as in law enforcement to make a like a relation, people always say, Well, officers that do too much are the ones that get in trouble. That, that that's not true, even though they they might be annoying. Or the officers that don't do enough get in trouble. Uh-uh. It's the ones that get caught in the middle. They caught stuck on pause. The ones that just question themselves are the ones that are in trouble, not the ones that do too much or too little. Well, you know, the good thing about my career in law enforcement is it was never had any incidents, never had anything to graduate. I mean, I finished out of there with a, 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 a you know, a clean sh uh, slate, you know, never had use of force incidents, anything like that. I, you know, I, I was able to separate the both. When I went to work, I was an officer. When I left there, I wasn't an officer. I was a regular guy. And that's what kept me from being able to do things. Extra. Why in the hell would I want to fight at work when I just fought for six hours off the job? That makes no sense. I don't want to do nothing. Hey, do you realize in 16, 17 years, I never used a taser before? I've cuffed people up. I had to pull it out. Never had to use it. Everything has always been verbal or hands-on, but I've never had the incidents, never went to, never got in trouble, nothing like that. And you think, hey, he's the fighter. He's, man, do you think I want to be fighting you? you? You learn how to use your mouth. Think about it. Pimps and prostitutes. Pimps get a prostitute to sell. 
their body and bring them the money. Well, you know how he controls them with their mouth. That's what you have to learn how to do. Use your mouth. You know what I mean? Trust okay. me. Can't beat up everybody. Well, Marvin, I, I mean, to add to that, you're also a very large figure. I think that helps also in instances in the prison. Well, they don't have to, they don't, in the, in the jail, they don't have to fight fair. They use knives and shivs and all this other kind of stuff, brother. So, so, you know, anyway. So Marvin here, so that you see, just so everybody knows how big it was, it was actually a four man tournament based over two events. Chuck fought Randy, you fought Vidor. Winner of those was going to yes, sir. head for a title. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That sucks. That sucks. Yeah. And it's, it's cool. Like I said, um, and unfortunately, here's something else. <laughs> and I ain't going to rain on nobody's parade, but it is what it is. Um, I, I got a picture on my Instagram <laughs> of Vitor when he fought me and then Vitor when he fought Couture. <laughs> and the difference is night and day. It looks like olive oil. It looks like Pluto and olive oil. And I took a picture of it and I said, and let me tell you what's funny. They didn't test us for the first one, but they tested for the title fight. They test for the title fight. They didn't test. And all I did was took, because he came up to me. Before the fight, I seen him, and he's, hey, Marvin, I'm a fan, such and such. And he shook he, he shook my hand, and I signed the autograph for him. And I didn't know who he was because his hair was long and stuff like this, and he's dieseled up. So, okay, whatever. Then after I'm done, you know what? Um, My manager, my, my trainer says, you know, that was Vitor, right? I said, what, for real? He's like, yeah, can't recognize the dude. Whatever, you already know what the deal is. So then I lose the fight. Then the next fight, and I'm looking, I'm like, what the hell? He looked like olive oil. Well, <laughs> anyway, I, I just well, think it's funny. See, just so people can, can understand, uh, when we interviewed Pat Militich, one of our prior interviews, Pat actually had to go in and give a pep talk to Vidor because he was such a head case when he was on and off the juice. If he wasn't on the juice, he had mental problems, like confidence issues. Bro, here's the thing. Some of those guys don't realize that, hey, I tell you what, all the money in the world is great, but if you can't function like a man, that money means nothing. You know what I'm saying? I don't even, I don't drink, I don't smoke. I've never smoked weed before. I've never took a drug before. I'm 100% square, but that's my choice. Even to this day, people say, do you drink? Nope, I don't smoke. I don't do none. I've never done none of that stuff ever, ever, ever. And the reason why, the reason why is not because it wasn't available. is because wrestling in high school, I had to get arthroscopic knee surgery. And what happened was, and I'll just tell you this so you kind of understand why. Not because it wasn't around, because weed and all that kind of stuff. Sure. Had only, it's all around me. What happened was, when when they put you to sleep, they they give you sodium pentothal to put you to sleep, and they give it to you and administer it to by weight. Well, that was the era of um, Run DMC, my Adidas, and you're wearing the big chains and the big jackets and the big shoes. Well, guess what I do? I go in there to have surgery, and I weigh in with all these clothes on. So what do you think they do? I'm 10 or 12 pounds over what I'm supposed to weigh, so guess what they do? When they put me to sleep, sodium pentothal, they minister it based off of the weight. So when I woke up from that surgery on my knee, I was hallucinating. Hallucinating, seeing doubles, and it's like I was on LSD, and I'm bugging out, and I keep waking up and going to sleep. It's supposed to be a one day surgery, come and go. Second time I wake up, hallucinating, hallucinating, bugging out. My mom is tripping out. The third time I remember in my mind, I said, God, if drugs feel like this, please let me wake up and I'll never do anything. I'll never smoke, I'll never drink, I'll do. Time I woke up. That was my calling card for me 
to never use any drug. Not, and I'm telling you, ask any of my friends. I don't drink, never have none of that. I'm, yeah, I tasted wine cooler, but, but I don't do that and never have. But it wasn't because I was different than anybody else. That experience was so horrific that I made a promise to God that I wouldn't do it because of that. Because I know I'd be one of those Lynn Bias guys. Do it one time and I'm dead. So, you know, but like I said, Vitor, he's going to be stuck for the rest of his life, bro. He's going to have to do that because he was on TRT and they said his testosterone level when he was doing his thing was at 100. That's like damn near non-functioning. Normal adolescence, 700, 800, you know, the 700s is the norm. That and dude had 100. Anything. Yeah, it wasn't producing anything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, he's stuck for the rest of his life. Can I ask you a favor? Can you yes. can you show us the scar? Huh? Can you, you show us you the scar in your head? The Vitor scar? You you can't see it. I'm a mutant. Real yeah. talk. I'm not looking see for it. it. Okay. Oh, there good you go. for you. Can yeah, you see it? Awesome. Very yeah. man. Good for yeah. you, bro. Yeah, see, it's the one the good thing is on my mother's side of the family, um, they have a uh, skin like baby baby a uh, baby bottle butts every all of my mothers my mothers all her sisters on my mom's side of the family they got that crazy skin and so they don't look like they don't look their age so i was happy because i kind of inherited that kind of yeah so I, you can't people always looking for a big keloid or something on my head no i didn't have plastic <laughs> surgery couldn't afford it <laughs> so yeah looking, i'm good i've been looking the whole interview <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and good for you yo here's the thing you bounce back you know whenever you hit a bottom like that some guys would have just walked and left the sport and when they went back to the gym you know january 24 2004 you got a rematch you king of the cage against your first loss and that's vernon tiger white yeah yeah we, we was down in florida and um but now i'm experienced you know i got some experience i'm doing my thing so um it was a different, different thing. Yeah, he he has more wars, but I'm but I'm more experienced now. So it's a pretty much pretty easy fight because of, uh, um, you know, he he uh, Vernon he went on a losing streak in the beginning when he first career, so he had a lot of experience. But then now I got experience now, and he's kind of in the middle of his career, so it was pretty pretty easy. I just double leg him and take him down and pepper him up really good but you know Vernon's a good dude he was he, I, I liked him he, he's just doing what he's supposed to do nobody goes in to lose you know they go to fight so so yeah it was it was a different ball game then you know dominant performance dominant performance yes sir yes sir Show that you had leveled up and yes, bounce sir. back from adversity yes sir yes sir were you ever supposed to fight Riddick Bowe in a kick in one of those Muay Thai bouts no what ended up happening is um, Riddick Bo came here. There was a company from Thailand that uh, was probably 213 or 212, 212, 213, I think. And um, Riddick Bo, I, I signed a, a four fight contract with this company that was doing Muay Thai matches. So what they did is me and Dewey Cooper and a couple other guys, we hooked up and we trained here. And I actually got to train with Riddick Bo for eight weeks to help teach him how to do Muay Thai so he could actually fight. And um, the crazy thing is you, you realize that's why they don't allow the, the the owner of the company to be the matchmaker. And the, you can't, he can't promote and be a, uh, uh, he can't be the promoter and can't be the matchmaker because obviously he's going to um, cater stuff to, uh, to the fighters. So yeah. what they do is they have the company over there and, the matchmaker and the owner of the company is the same guy. So here's the crazy thing. They give me a guy that's 6'6". Six, 6'6", six. Six, six, full rules, right? Riddick Bo fights a guy that's my size, 5'9", 210, but has Muay Thai experience and Riddick is only a boxer. They give Riddick Bo... I mean, they give me the guy that's Riddick Bowe's size. So you, you can understand, it's like the 6'6 six, six guy fights the 5'9 guy. 
Then the twice. five nine guy fights the six six guy instead of having the two five nine guys fight each other and the six six guys fight each other. They match me up with the guy that's six six. I'm like, really? So now it's full rules. So um the guy just leg kicks Riddick Bo to death and stops him. And my Riddick guy just, like, left the ring. He left the ring at one point, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was getting stepped over the top up. rope and said, I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it was, you know, he got, Riddick Bo told me this, you know, it's funny, he said, he called me Beast, he said, Beast, let me tell you something, man, uh, he said, I'm fighting for $50,000, he said, I used to pay my sparring partner that money, he says, at one time, I could go to my bank account, and I had $50 million in the bank, he said, my wife and uh, Brock Newman took all my money, and I was like, damn, I mean, literally, like, he said, what I've made for the fight, I used to pay my sparring partners. I was like, wow, you know, but yeah, but that was how it ended up, you know, I think it was, he probably needed the money, but you know, 50,000. You can't blame a guy. I mean, you know? if, if he needs some money, it is what it is. Yeah. Man. Oh, he's a I good dude. That, you know, when he got paid millions, that's when he gave a hundred percent. It's hard to give a hundred percent when you're making a fraction, you know, you got to yeah, understand yeah. the psychology. Oh, yeah. Of it, you know? oh he yeah. He's a good all. dude. Now I'm going to give my all for this. Right. Yeah, he, he's a good dude. Trust me when I tell you he's a good dude. I love them, man. I just kind of hate. He, he really emphasized that his old lady and Rock Newman duped him, you know, duped him pretty good. But I couldn't even imagine going to my bank account saying 50 million. He said, man, 50 million I had in the bank at one time. I was like, wow. You know, so, but, you know, and the the you got to be, you gotta be on point, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. At this time, Tito Ortiz, you're helping him train for Guy Metzger. Right. Guy Metzger falls off the car. Does Joe Silva try to make you and Tito fight? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. I, me, and, me and Tito, I'll give you a prime example. I, I, I will tell you something. that That's why I said I had the worst luck in the world in the UFC. Any other organization, I got fights that wasn't in the UFC. If they would happen in UFC, I would have been a Big, a great star, a big star. Imagine this. Tito is there. Me and Tito are training together. We're training, we're training, we're training together for this fight. Now, I'll give you something. So, like I said, something else nobody knows but the people in my camp. But Tito knows because he was there. We're training. I don't know if Chris remembers a drill that you call it a 21. Um, it's where you go with a you go seven rounds with one a, a, a different person every every minute. You 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 do you wrestle with one guy and then you stand up another guy. Then a, then this guy you do this and this and for seven minutes, and then you get a break and then you do seven minutes again. But it's a different guy, a fresh guy every minute for twenty one minutes. I was in the cage and I was training, and I was on my fifth guy and they give you bodies. So we had a kid that was coming in that was helping out. He was supposed to wrestle with me. So we're wrestling, we're fighting and doing a thing like this. I shoot on a guy, and there's a technique that you use to, to kick the spin off the cage. So I double leg him, and I shoot back, and he kicks off the cage. And when he kicks off the cage, he knees me right in the head, knocked out, cold. I ain't talking about I wobbled, knocked out, cold, concussion. Well, old school, you know what you do? You shake it off, you get up. Yeah. Continue the 21s. I finished it. The next day, me and Tito are doing takedowns. Now, and I ain't trying to put Tito on blast or nothing like this, but this is how it happened, and I got it on videotape so I can confirm it. It's not a big deal. And that's my dog. And it's just, you know, whatever. Stuff hey, you and Tito are room. good. It's part of we practice. Cool. It, ain't, it ain't no funk, but Tito know the truth. I'm double-legging Tito and I'm taking him down. And I keep taking him down. I'm taking Tito down. And he's, he's getting pissed. Because we're doing five-minute rounds. You know what Tito does? When I'm shooting, he jumps guard. What do you think happened? Oh. Think about it. What do you think happened? When he jumped guard when I'm shooting. Another knee. What do you think happened to me? Yeah. 
Knocked out. Knocked oh, out. Any good. Two bro. knockouts. Two knockouts. Already got a concussion. Take another knee to the head. I'm knocked out. What do we think we do? Old school. Continue training. Now, Guy Metzger gets hurt. Now they're looking at me. We can't fight each other because... Wait, hold up, hold up. Do you think is this is Joe Silva saying, I know these two are training partners, I know they're close, now I'm going to make them fight each other? I don't know if he knew that we were training together. Okay. I don't know. I, I can't confirm that he knew I was training with him or not. I can't confirm that. But it's possible because Dana showed up at the gym. It's possible. I don't know. Because I think they had to propose that to Tito's camp first um, before they proposed it to us. It's like, because Skip came and told me, he said, man, Marvin, Tito training together. You know, they, they can't fight Game each plan. Other. Game yeah. plan. Yeah. yeah, can't do that. So... Hence, they find somebody else. They find uh, the guy from Canada, Patrick Cote. Patrick Cote. And then they give me uh, the, the, the jiu-jitsu guy. Travis um, Luter. Travis Luter. So that's why the ghost punch, uh, people, you know, people actually really think I took a dive. They actually, people think I took a dive. Like, I really took a dive. He's a... He, Come on. It, it, I'm not hating, but it should have been a kick cake fight for me. You double leg, you put him on the ground, you ground him, pound, the fight is over. He, they, I mean, people actually thought I took a dive. The dude barely touched me and I went to sleep. I was already had a concussion. But, yeah. I, but you, you know what I'm saying? So, like I said, people don't know. That's why I said I got the most terrible, terrible, terrible UFC luck. The fight with Vitor, the stuff before, and a fight with him. Two not two 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 knees to the head, knocked out, had a concussion. They suspended me for ninety days. Had to get a MRI. I went, got an MRI. You got a concussion. Had to go to Nevada. I'm suspended for ninety days. They make me take another MRI to get the 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 the, the suspension lifted because you're suspended in the state that you you fought because they suspend you immediately. But I had to get it cleared here in United, in um uh, in Nevada. So and then. Here's the crazy thing. You look on YouTube and they got fighters, uh, 25 fighters with the weakest chin. Guess who's the first one? Oh, come on, man. Insane, Guess man. who's the first one? Okay. I'm the, uh, me. Wait, Marvin, hold up. Hold up. The people that make these videos, I've, I've, we, we've had some uh, no. incidents recently, no. but uh, let me just speak my piece. Gotcha. They have no inside information. They've got no connection to the fight game. Their only input are videos that they've seen, and they draw ridiculous clickbait conclusions in order to make them a professional, like a professional person that gives some sort of response to shit that they know absolutely nothing about. Right, right. It, it's just imagine this. Let me just, and I want to just explain. And I, to me, it's just part of the game. My, my skin is tough. I don't trip For off sure. that. But, but just think about it from my perspective. Um, people have inside information, but imagine this. Imagine this. Do you realize what you just said? You said it's considered one of the worst cuts in UFC history. Do you remember Alistair Overeem's look like he ate a... Um, that uh, was years uh, later. That was years later. That oh. was crazy. Yeah, yeah, years later. But you see, but imagine this. Joe Rogan, and I wanted to talk to him because I'm cool with him, but it's, it's a trip. 15, 16 years later, somebody gets a cut. And and Joe Rogan says, oh, that cut's bad, but it's not the bad. Oh, the worst cut I've ever seen was Marvin Eastman's cut. Oh, uh, <laughs> and it's been quite a few ugly cuts. When imagine 15, 16 years later, He's still, He's still putting really you on blast. My like, God damn, dude. I mean, Wait a minute. Me. Wait, is he putting you on blast? To me, that's dude. respect. He's putting your name. No, am I off? Let, let, me, let me explain something to you. What I'm, what I'm getting to you is this. If I lost the fight with a clear mind, 
I could take that, but I fought the guy. And nobody knows about that. You understand? If I lose, I got think about it. I lost to Rampage the second time. He, he won fair and square. He won fair and square. Nothing. The only other thing about this is, imagine this. It's the fighter's responsibility to come into a fight right. It's not somebody else's fault if this person doesn't come on 100%. If your car, if you're racing me in your car, you got a Mustang, and I got a Mustang, and you ain't got no gas, and you lose, that's your fault, not my fault. It's my responsibility. But at least you know, god dang it, I don't want to make excuses. Hey, by the way, I just want to let you know uh, I had this issue. That's why I couldn't fight. Most people say, you just make an excuse. But some people make excuses because they lost and it was fair and square versus let me fight you um, 100%. If I lose at 100%, then I can take that. But nobody really knows. So you just have to take it on the chin. You know what I mean? And that's why you think it's so hard multiple years hearing Joe Rogan go, oh, that that fight. Oh, that's not a that's a bad cut, but it's not as bad as Marvin Eastman. I'm like, dude, do you even know? Because half these people don't even know. It's like, well, how would you know? I haven't told anybody. You wouldn't privy to that. But <laughs> it's still kind of still kind of a dig. You understand? No, exactly. Seventeen he, he, years yeah, later, he doesn't have the whole story. He doesn't have a. Now I hate to get on my soapbox, Marvin, but I'm going to do it for a minute here. We've done 150 interviews. If there's one thing we learned is you can't ask the fighter if they want to continue or if they want to do the fight. You're right. You're right. You're it's right. the responsibility of the commission's doctors yes, to sir. spot that you've been hurt. Yes, when sir. When they put a light in your eyes, they should be like, hey, this guy's fucked up. You know, something. <laughs> but they, all they right. do is the paperwork, right. I think. You know? Right. So, you know, right. I told yeah, you, you, you didn't do anything really wrong, especially from the time a lot of fighters probably put themselves second and, you know, did the fight first. You can't right. make a decision. You know, you got blacks in round four. Can you continue? Yeah. 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 You can't leave it to the fighters. The doctors should be doing a better job. You, you're too right. You're too, I, I'm not making excuses. You know what? To me, bro, I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. But to me, you, you're going to get 100% effort from me, win or lose. I'll never go. I, I got two fights in my career that I wish that I could do over. Everything else, eh, whatever. Two fights. Two fights. You know what you're for? Glover Teixeira. Okay. Okay. If, if you would remind, allow me to explain to Miguel some of the politics. I worked at Cook County Jail for a while as well. Oh, yeah. That's crazy. That guy calling Marvin right before his fight was absolutely intentional. It was to absolutely, because that's the mentality. When you work at the Joe, you become an inmate in the way you think. And his jealousy and being a, a cocksucker, because that's what he is, I'm going to break this news to him right at weigh-ins. Watch what happens. Hey, that's 100% planned. Of course. Of course. But, you know, you got to be able to separate one from the other. And I could do that, but you got to remember. Um, you don't forget it, though. Yeah, you, you, yeah. It's after yeah. a while. I mean, imagine it. I got a friend that's I, I I grew up playing Pop Warner football with this guy. Cool as all day. Do you realize? Still on my Instagram page, I'll still get somebody that will send me a clip. Of my face being cut. I'm like, Come what, on, do man. You ex- what do you expect me to say? Oh, yes. I never hey, seen thank it. you. <laughs> I mean, literally, like somebody will send me a clip and it'll show me getting cut. And I'm like, and so my buddy did it. He sent it. Hey, man, look, he sent the picture of him. I was like, I, I said it. I said, I said, I said, bro, I said, why would you send that to me? And I was like, did you think I didn't see it? You think I ain't seen it a million times? I'm like, what did you think to accomplish by sending me a picture? You, my partner. I mean, I can understand a fan, somebody being, or somebody trying to throw smart, but what did you think it was going to accomplish by doing that? And we got it back and forth. And I was like, and I kind of lit him up. 
and we we kind of stopped talking for a little while. Finally, after a while, I think he kind of got it. Because to a person who don't know you, what difference does it make? But it's different. It feels different when it's coming from somebody that you actually care about. You know what I'm saying? So very personal. It, it, yeah. It don't have the same sting that it used to have, but still, we talking about man, 17, 18 years ago, bro. I'm still getting well, you know, it also like for the time it went viral, but that, that's you when you agree to enter into that cage, you're willing to die. Essentially, what you're doing is you're willing to die. And right. anybody to disrespect that or what takes place there, I got issues with that. Well, it's kind of like the guy that don't fight at all talking about somebody who actually had the balls to go in there and fight and do his thing, and he ends up losing the fight. Trust me. i tell you what. Let me tell you what. I had 18 kickboxing matches. 20, 20 plus box. Uh, uh, I fought professional boxing when I won that one fight by knockout. You know what's funny? Getting locked up in that little MMA cage for King of the Cage. You know how intimidating that little thing is. In my gym, I got the same type cage uh, that you had. It's a fighting cage. It ain't a grappling cage. The cage that they use in the UFC, you can run to Africa. This little cage and the cage they have in the king of the cage, it makes you fight. There's nowhere to go. And when they close, you had 5,000 people on at Saboba standing, yelling, cheering around this little ass cage, and you look around and you can't get out, it's like, oh, damn. This, this is real. At least the boxing ring has the illusion that you can get out. That cage is mm-hmm. intimidating, bro. It's a totally different ball game and you in the dark and on a, a, um, a reservation and all these screaming drunk fans is getting at you. Totally different ball game, man, you know? So it, it, it's something for the person. Huh? Interesting, man. Oh, man, it's a whole different ball game. You get to talking. Oh, one minute. One minute of pad work is one thing, but five minutes of getting your brains beat out, totally different ballgame, bro, you know? Chris knows. He you know, he, he's, he know exactly what the hell I'm talking about, man, you know? <laughs> Marvin, you mentioned kickboxing. You fought August 7, 2004 against Ray Seffo in Las Vegas. A little bad blood between you two. Um, let, let me, I could, give me a, let me give you a heads up. Well, you were out of out of weight. You were way above your weight class as well. Yeah, yeah. But you're heavyweight. So here's the thing. He, before this kickboxing match, um, I was supposed to fight him in an MMA fight. They We signed a contract. I forget what organization it was. Supposed to give us 50000 to fight. It was MMA. Uh, he backed out. I can't remember what organization it was. It's gonna pay me fifty thousand, and uh, and I don't know what he was gonna get paid. Was, was it affliction? Paid. I think so. It, it was some organization. It was, it was supposed to be fifty and fifty or something like that. Okay. Yeah, I think it was. And um, so he didn't take it. But then K one, we go, and I ain't got no funk with him. He's just another opponent. So. We're going, we're going. And and you know how when if you hit the ground or if you touch the ground, the, the ref automatically wipes your gloves to make sure nothing gets in your in your eye. Well, something gets in my eye from his his uh his gloves. So was his glove or his toe? I don't know what it was. It was something in my eye. I don't know. Yeah. So it, it could have been. He tried to kick or something, whatever. So I go and I can't see, and they put me in a neutral corner. Well, in boxing, the neutral corner, you're supposed to, they put to put the other fighter in the opposite corner. Well, he goes to the same corner inside that I am. So the ref looks over and he says, stay there. And he walks me to the other side, cleans my eye out. He looks and Ray Sefu walks to the other side again. The ref warns him, get in that corner. And he starts walking back. He comes back up to me. Checks my eyes. Yeah, you cool. You cool like this. And I said, yeah. So he gets ready to start the match. 
Well, Sefu starts walking behind the ref and he puts his hand up like he's saying, my bad, I'm sorry. So I put my hand up to touch gloves with him because he's saying, I'm sorry. He's going, my bad. He's shaking his head and he's putting his hands up to touch gloves. I put my hand up to touch gloves. The dude three pieces me. Bing, 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 bing. And, and then raises his hands up like he won. And I'm like, and the crowd goes nuts and they start throwing bottles and they start throwing stuff. I'm like, nah, you whatever like this. I'm like, so it starts a starts a little mini ride in there. And I'm like, man, what kind of stuff is this? But then if you know the rules of the game, they say protect yourself at all times. The only time that you it's necessary to touch gloves is in, in the beginning of the fight because the referee is uh, monitoring it. So, if a fighter decides to touch glove with another fighter, they do it at their own risk, a la um, Mayweather versus the, the Mexican oh, kid that headbutted him. Same. Yep. Totally legal. Didn't have to touch gloves. You know what that well, taught me? Uh, Marvin, all right. So, I, I watched it on video a couple times. This is what I see. I see him throw a kick. I think his toe gouged your eye. Referee Good. stops it. He's doing the corner stuff. The referee doesn't have control of Seppo, and Seppo's a veteran. Yeah. Seppo's got yeah. a few hundred fights. Yeah. So he's like, Seppo's as grimy as it gets when it yes, comes sir. to fighting. Yes, he sir. Is. He goes behind the referee, throws a three-piece, you're a little wobbly, instead of just giving you a, an eight-count or the referee going, wait a minute. You know, you just came from behind me. Stop it. Take a point, warning, whatever. Start over. The referee's inexperienced. Sefo was taking advantage of it, and Sefo got a a, a KO, which right, right. It was and, and 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 everything you say is a hundred percent accurate. What it taught me was this: Hey, blood, you eating? Yeah, I'm eating right, I'm eating right now. Okay, so what it taught me was this: it taught me a valuable lesson. Don't touch gloves unless the referee recommends it or or isn't uh uh and and you know what it taught me is I stopped touching gloves in MMA fights too. Everyone's got a story like that. I don't touch I don't touch gloves. Some people do it every round. And I stopped that. He taught me that hundred percent. I took it to heart. I there's a difference between Acknowledge and I mean experience and knowledge. You're you're you you totally and you learn that by having fights. And trust me, when I tell you I stopped touching gloves with people because of that. So part of the game, I accept it. But the only bad thing about it is we got we both got suspended. We got suspended for that. Well, you guys fought after work in the ring. Who? He threw a couple punches at you afterwards. Oh, yeah, yeah, it started off. It started off. It was a fight afterwards, and that's why we end up the, the Nevada Boxing Commission suspended us both. We both had to have uh, hearings, and we had to show up. Well, guess what? You know what he didn't do? He didn't show up. And uh, you don't show up. You got to remember that's IG. That's that's a legal binding thing. Um, I showed up. They kept the both of our purses, and and the only way did you get your purse? released is is if they don't suspend you they kept our purses i went in front of the boxing commission gave them my spill they they didn't suspend me gave my, gave me my money guess hey, what hey, hold know? on did you go in uniform oh no no oh no. come on bro you no. gotta use that no <laughs> no <laughs> no so you know you know he didn't show up to his they kept his purse so he was suspended for a year. He couldn't compete here in the, in the states for a year, and then after a year, you just reapply. But but yeah, he didn't he didn't show up for his. Did you guys ever so, talk after? No. Oh, he, that, do you realize that dude's still mad at me to this day? He's mad at Literally. you. Oh yes, sir. He's yeah, the one that did it. I, yes, sir. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you how cold this is. I have a a fighter that was. We were training at Syndicate, and now we had to go over to um, – they left and went to Couture's. 
So I would go over there to train my fighter. Do you know that dude walks by me like he never see never seen me? I kid my guys on on um his World Series, and he had to deal with me as the matchmaker promoter. But it's very very difficult because that dude still holds a grudge to this day. So it makes it very difficult for me for me to be able to get any of my fighters on that promotion because of his grudge towards me. Damn. Still from this fight. I mean, literally, like, like, man, you think I'd give a damn about that? If I was we was in our 30s, man. I'm 50. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I ain't tripping off of that. But he's still he's still pissed off about that. This day. <laughs> I see him at Couture's when I train. You think that dude says what's up or anything? Yo. He, he looked like I'm like the plague, dude. I mean, literally. Well, I mean, here's the thing. He did this, like, Marvin, I watched it. You oh, got no part in any repercussions that he absorbed. He did all that himself. When I tell you, when I tell you that dude does not speak or talk to me. <laughs> and like I said, I got one of my fighters right now that I've been, would love to get on his promotion or even a girl that I'm that needs some help from me, but they're afraid to deal with me because they're worried about the repercussions from Sefu. Real talk. Wow. I mean, can you wow. believe that? Come on, man. So that's Ray Sefu, I mean, just so everybody's on the same page here, incredible K1 kickboxer. He's also the head of World Series of Fighting. Yeah, it's giving up and like I said, when I'm, days, like when it's I, nothing. When I tell you, I, I wish that I could get my my guy Jordan on the squad or my oh my son, but the the impediment is is me. So if they do it, they have to do it not through me because the bias is with that K one fight instead of saying, hey, look, I got the I need the best fighters. So. You know, because I, I, I would love to have my guy on there, one of my guys or my such and such like this, but you have to go through him. So it's already it's already a, a little pre prejudice a little bit, you know? I tell you, I think I think I know where it comes from. One, he's slick as fuck. Like, he is slick, especially playing that referee. He, I mean, it's – he can't call it any other thing. <laughs> him not knocking you out. Like, he was trying to knock you out by doing that three-piece – I mean, you just shoulder rolled, shoulder rolled. You didn't get stunned by any of that. You just, you were off balance and it was awkward. I don't know why the referee stopped it, but then afterward you were like, really? This is what you wanted yeah, to do? Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Like you kind of told him, all right, oh, yeah. you got it. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it was just like, well, his plan didn't work out the way he wanted it to. Well, well you know, you know, my boy, one well, of my partners that I fought twice and I, I knocked him out twice, but he he served Ray Sefu up in K1 in Japan, and gave him a gave served him up bad. Um, Carter Williams, <laughs> Carter Carter Williams touched him up something fierce. So it was cool, and I ended up knocking out Carter Williams twice. So so I was thankful Carter Williams got my get back for me. So Carter Williams was a K uh, K1 American champion, and I I knocked him out twice. But he served up um, Sefu for me, so that was kind of the yeah, nice. Yes, well, nice. Sir. You yes, smiled. Sir. You smiled while watching that. Well, Miguel, so check this out. He fights Vincent Lawler. He wins. Jason Lambert loses a split decision, and then he winds up fighting for famed promoter Jamie Levine. <laughs> yeah, what was Jamie like? Jamie was really good, man. Jamie was. Jamie, all the slimy stuff that y'all used to say, what people would say about him, Jamie was nothing but 100 with me. I mean, I, like I said, I, I don't have one iota anything bad to say about J Jamie. Uh, even on my my um the the fights that I had for him, that dude was a one with me, uh, and he took care of me, and I I got he multiple praise on the WF for their tra treatment with me. And like I said, he actually paid me really good too. So trust well, me when I say I got he, nothing bad to he say. Didn't, did he try to pay you in DVDs and VHS tapes to sell on eBay? 
Hell, come hey, on, Marvin. I don't know. He must have thought. He must have thought. I don't know. Here, here's the thing. I'm an officer, but <laughs> keep it real. I'm, I'm, I, yeah. I, I was raised in the hood too. You know what I'm saying? So you ain't gonna, I ain't gonna be. I'm trying to be pretty correct, but I'm not gonna drink the Kool Aid. You know what I'm saying, yeah. Jim Jones? So, <laughs> so, yeah, you ain't, you ain't too far removed from. Yeah, you not, know, you, not too I, concerned I, about catching the hey, case. I, I do need I to remind tell, you. I can tell. Yes, yeah, sir. I could tell the inmates sometimes. I say, "Excuse the French," and you can bleep it off if you want to. I can go from zero to nigga in two seconds. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so, so I'll, for I'll everybody, tell you, though, you forget your. Hold up. That was Marvin. That was Marvin, that was Marvin that said that, not Mike or Miguel. It, it was that me. Was it was me. <laughs> so, but but you're forgiving Jamie one thing because now he paid you well. You're a guy, you know, obviously a poster boy kind of guy. You're getting good treatment there. And uh, I think you're a middleweight, and I think Jamie himself held his middleweight belt. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> for me, I fought I fought for him at light heavyweight. So okay. I, never fought, <laughs> I never fought middleweight for him, light heavyweight. But honestly, like I said, uh, um, Jamie paid me good money. I didn't I didn't have any issue. Was never a problem with anything. I don't know, maybe whatever, but he, he never stooped me. I never had no problem with no money, nothing. I, whatever ever, anybody else has a problem with Jamie, that dude was A1 for me. It, he, he never treated me out of pocket. I never had a problem with money. I never had a problem with nothing. He didn't pay me in, you know, Bitcoin or, or, or food. Merchandise. Or nothing. I was good. Yeah, I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was cool. I got nothing bad to say about Jamie. He, 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 was, he was always okay to me. So j just so everybody at home can kind of understand, fighters like Chad Saunders would go online and publicly plea with Marvin, please don't fight for this guy anymore. You know, he owes everybody money except you. Um, let's talk about your WEF run, though. This is really important. I know you're, you're kind of – we're coming on two hours. You beat Jason McDonald by decision. You knock out Anthony Ray on September 24, 2005. Dude, you beat Alan Belcher. Yeah. That dude's yeah. a stud. Yeah, he Alan's a good dude. And I know he I, I think I talked to him about a year ago, and I think he he's pretty big. He ain't nowhere near no light heavyweight no more. But um uh yeah, but like I said to me, um I had no idea who no Alan Belcher was, and you have to kind of go when you're fighting, you don't really care about who shows up, you know, and, and honestly, for me, it worked a lot better when you just go over there and you make adjustment on the fly, because sometimes you can, you, some people, if they're mentally and strong, they can um, mentally tap themselves out of a fight and they'll be out of the fight before they actually fight. So I just, my mentality was like, I don't give a damn who shows up. It ain't like I can back out. So I got to fight. And that's just the bottom line, you know? But let me ask you a question. Are you, you ever been sitting around with the fellow officers, maybe watch a fight, you know, maybe watching the UFC, Alan Belcher comes on and you, you you get to be like, yeah, I beat that guy. Um, <laughs> Well, because here's the thing about this, bro, and I know you know it to the fullest. I can tell you this. Look at Tito Ortiz's record. Look at Chuck Liddell. I mean, not Chuck Liddell. Look at Randy Couture's record. It's not really reflective of how good of a fighter they are. And the reason why is because of the competition that they fought. All it that. takes is one mistake and you can lose a fight that you were winning. So it's not like boxing. I got to go 30 and 0. And then if you don't, if you got a record, it's like 10 and two or 10 and three or 10 and four and in boxing, you're a journeyman, you know, but Randy Couture is a multiple world champion, and his record, he only got, I don't think he even has 20 wins. He has less than that. But Okay, oh, Coleman. Yeah, Coleman. Because, because it's, it's, exactly, because it's, it doesn't, it's not indicative of the competition. The difference is, think about this. This is the one thing the UFC it. does. The UFC don't give breaks. They throw you to the dogs. The only way that the UFC don't throw you to the dogs is if you're their poster boy, if you're somebody they want to get some wins. Up. For instance, like um, 
the the, the Mexican kids that, that just got in right now, um, the youngest Rosas. fighter, they're Rosas. It behooves them for the Mexican community for that stuff to promote that kid because he has a following and, and he can make money. They can do stuff. It, it would help the brand. They, they have a brand going over there in Mexico that they're doing their thing. It behooves them. There's certain fighters that they'll get that it behooves them to put them in a situation where it benefits the, the company and it benefits the fighter because it can make them some money. But you, but Chris, you know, UFC don't give breaks. You fight the best. And they throw you to the dogs. And guess what? If you don't win and you don't perform, if you're not in their graces, adios, walking papers, homie. That's the way it works. They don't, man, every goddamn fight they ever gave in the UFC was a dog. They don't give you no punks. They throw you to the they throw you to the yeah. wolves and you have to fight. So it's part of the game. And if you get somebody Murph, that's huh? Murph, anybody that looks at your record and they just see a number, I would even call them a casual. They don't even know what they're talking about. Look at the names on it. That's it. Look at the yeah. names are rattling off. Yeah. Before you had 10 fights, you've got three world champions on your belt. Alan Belcher in February, is fighting for the bare knuckle boxing world title. He's still in the game. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, Al, Alan's a good dude, man. He's, he's a good really dude. I, I like always like, him. and I was happy because he 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 actually got. You know, I lost the fight in in Canada to this guy. He uh, threw an overhand and. Broke my nose and my nose bleeding so bad they wouldn't stop bleeding and he stopped the fight. But Allen ended up fighting him and serving him up in the UFC and I was kind of thankful because uh, he did that. I, like I said, I don't got nothing bad to say about Allen. Allen was a good dude though, and he he actually is a great competition. Like I said, stuff happens in the game. You know good and well you could be winning something and make one mistake and then you lose a fight. So, um, because like I said, this sport the best fighter don't always win. No. You think about this. Give you a prime example. Think about this. Cormier is a world champion multiple times. The only person that he ever had, he just met his match with was John Jones. John Jones just kind of had his number. He beats everybody else, but something with him and John Jones, he just, the matchup is not right. But then think about this. John Jones fights um, the Swedish guy, and that dude, Good bad sense. boy, Gustafsson, bad yeah. boy. It's a pick em, whoever won that fight. Now, to me, if I was Gustafsson, it's camp, I'd say, man, you, you, you think about this. I always tell my fighters, I said, if you're going to fight a fight, I said, if you were fighting yourself, how would you beat yourself? So you have to look for your weakness. You know what? I was a wrestler and I was never on my back. So you know what I did? All my time at the jujitsu, I stayed on my back just in case. Do you know? In all my fights, I was never taken down. I got taken down one time. And you know who it was by? It was by uh, Arona. You know how I got taken down? He shot on me and pulled my pants down and then took me down. Um <laughs> He took me down, and it was uh, the yellow cards. What you need, buddy? Uh, One second. Looking to talk to someone about signing out. Oh, man. Uh, damn. Dave. Dave. My man up front. One second, buddy. I'm sorry. He's got two customers during this interview. Yeah. Man. So, so um, Life is good, bro. Well, I got my, my fighter back there. He, he, the gentleman want to get some information. But, Go ahead, man. But he, shot business, on, he shot Great on course. me. I wear Muay Thai shorts. So what he did is he shot, pulled my pants down to my legs, and then that's how he was able to take me down. Well, obviously it wasn't legal. So they they doing the three card um system like they do in Pride. The war the first one they take a part of your purse, second one take half of your purse, the third person you get you you lose your um you lose the card. It was in Brazil. So that was well, it was at Vitech Combat. It yes. was Carlson Gracie. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah. but 
I've never been taken down because I, I prided myself on that. And uh, but I wanted to prepare. I said if I got on my back, that would probably be the way that I would probably the worst thing because when you're a wrestler, you're taught not to go to your back. How do you? So you you have to train what your phobia is, what it is that oh my god, what a what, do you remember what happened to um, Kevin Randleman the first oh, wait, time he got wait wait, wait wait we got to finish up we got to finish up with with the Rona. This is what's, okay. This is. I need to talk to you about this. I don't know if it's ever okay. crossed your mind. Okay. So that was September 12, 2009, Vitesh Combat. You okay. lost the decision. So in the first round, it was a close round, but I, I would give it to Arona. Mm -hmm. In the second round, there was a moment where you shook Arona off of you, and the way Arona falls to the ground, it tells you he is dead tired. It, okay, in that second round, I did a timer. They stopped the round before, like you were on top, ready to finish. They rang the bell, I want to say about 18 to 20 seconds ahead of time. Yes, sir. Yes, and sir. In the third round, <laughs> All the he does... cardio machine. Yes, sir. Comes in with a takedown. So, Panama Lewis was a, uh, is a famous boxing trainer. Yep. Um, down in Florida, I think he's living right now. He yep. used to have something what he referred to as the mix. And I'm not saying Arona had asthma medication in his water bottle. <laughs> but him wobbling to his corner and coming with a strong takedown in the third round and just maintaining that top dominant position and at a pace that was just furious, it leads me to believe that there was something a little off there. You know, here, here's the thing. I look at it like this. <laughs> the best judge is usually fans and and I guess all I can really say is the way that I love my fighter that I got right here and his nickname is KO because you know the only thing that's un indisputable knockout. You knock everybody out, you can get a yellow envelope, you can get paid, and guess what happens? The knockout is undisputed, or a submission is undisputed. There's no way that you can lose a fight by knocking somebody else. So what I say to you is, is this. If you don't want to deal with any cheating, anything like that, you win by knockout or you win by submission, and it's un it's indisputable. And that's it's part of the game, you know, because... That's, and that's going into his home country, his yeah. his you know yes, sir. managers. Yes, sir. Are, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> the writing was on the wall, man. Yes, you sir. Know, you got paid to go on vacation, but yes, they sir. shorted and you in the second round, and then that third round it was hellacious. There's a little, there's a couple other things of controversy I'd like to talk to you about. Okay. But first, Stefan Patry, how was he as a promoter? Uh, PKO Patrick. president. Um, what what um organization? TKO, TKO in Canada. Uh, oh no no he they treated me good, they treated me good too. Trust I, me. I like Stefan. Yeah, I Stefan like was really really good. They took care of me, had me in a um twenty fourth twenty fifth floor suite parlay the whole nine yards. Dude was awesome, and I got to go to Vancouver. It was lovely. It was. Lovely. They 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 treated me really good. So I got not one iota complaint from him. Okay. I had to think about it because I forgot what you were saying. <laughs> okay. So pride in the UFC, they're coming to a head. They're like they're battling. And this is before Pride had all those Yakuza issues. Well, they always had Yakuza issues, but they weren't public. October 21st, 2006, Pride 32. They get scheduled to Las Vegas. You were supposed to fight uh, Kazuhiro Nakamura. So what's the class? You got forced off the card because you had a WFA contract still. Uh, yes and no, but that is not why um, I didn't fight. Okay, go ahead. Um, I'm gonna move over here because a little loud. Um, the reason why I didn't fight is is because. I haven't. I had an off-duty incident. 
I was uh uh I, I was off duty. I was on vacation. My kid, my oldest boy that's 29 now was 13. Split up with my mother. We had split custody. Make a long story short, I have to drop the kid off. He gets them two days, and I get the, uh, the kid the other day. We, we, we alternated. Basically, what happened was I dropped my kid off because he's supposed to go to his mother's for the weekend. They get into an argument when I'm leaving. He calls me to come and pick him up. It's in the summer. It's, a, it's Well, it's May, but it's 110 degrees outside. I meet at the uh, the local school to pick him up. He jumps out the car, he gets in my car. Uh, somebody is doing a custody exchange in the parking lot too. Now remember, I'm an officer, North Las Vegas. Well, they see my kid get out the car, run into my car. They call the police. Yeah, they call the police. Somebody reported black man beating a white woman in the parking lot. Oh, come on, man. Yes, sir. So, my kid gets in my car. He's sitting in the car. My ex, which is the, the, the officer, that used to be an yeah. officer, she ain't there no more, tells me, can you come into my car so I can tell you what happened? So, what I do is I get out the car. I get in her car. My kid is in my car. We're sitting there in a car that's idling. It's 110 degrees outside. And we're talking. Needless to say, after we're talking the whole nine yards, three North Las Vegas Police Department cars pull up behind oh. my car. Now we got the the windows rolled up, and first thing they do is they start yelling commands. We look behind, like, man, what the hell? This you talking to us? Yeah, yeah. The same plate department that I work for. I'm like, what the hell's going on? So what I do is. I open the door to try to find out. Guy's got a gun on me. Close the door, close the door, close the door. I'm like, closing the door. They're all yelling commands. Ugh. Open the door, close the door, such and such like this. Turn off the car, turn off the car. Now the windows are up. Can't turn off, can't, can't roll the windows now. Open the door, close the door, such and such. I look out. A guy I used to work with at the penitentiary. I know the guy's name is, uh, I can't, oh, okay. I, well, I work with him from, uh, for multiple years. We worked in the penitentiary together. He works in North Town like me. I'm like, Miller, it's Eastman, man. What the hell's going on? I don't give a damn. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. I'm like, man, what the hell's going on? So they're giving all these multiple commands back and forth, back and forth. I'm like, dude, I'm one of you guys. What the hell's going on? Get out the car. Get out the car. So I get out the car. I just got finished training at, at JSEC. Get on the ground, get on the ground. That's 110 degrees outside. Ugh. So I lay down on the ground. I'm like, dude, what's going on? You, you, you know me. I don't give a F. Get on the ground. So I lay down prone on the ground. My kid is in my car. My, my ex is in the other car. Put your face on the ground. Man, you got you out your damn mind. It's 110 degrees, man. You know that's an unlawful command. You can't have me put my face on the ground. I'm not playing with you. Get on the ground. Put your face on the ground. I said, man, you crazy. Now, you're not talking to somebody who's a, a newbie. You're talking about somebody that's yeah. versed in the like flexing. you. He's flexing. Yeah. Put your face on the ground. I'm not playing. I said, I'm not putting my face on the ground. Do what you got to do. So, pulls his taser out, shoots me in the back tases me now i know how they work they cycle fifty thousand volts for five seconds and every time you pull the trigger it cycles another a cycle so if you pull the trigger three times it'll cycle 15 it'll it'll show one one burst for 15 second intervals so it shoots me in the back it rolls me over it cycles for 15 seconds it rolls me under the car i'm upside down with these taser prongs in my back Turn over, turn over. Now, you know me. I'm 4%, 5% body fat. Just come from the gym training. And I can't move. I can't move. 
So they snatch me up, put me in double set of cuffs. They throw me in the back of the car. They snatch my ex out, put her in cuffs, throw her in the car. They take my 13-year-old kid that's 13 years old at the time, cuff him up, throw him in the back of the car. So they got us all cuffed up. Make a long story short, the report is white woman getting beat by a black man in the parking lot. Well, my ex is Mexican and my son is black and Mexican. How do you mistake those for two white girls? So on videotape, the whole nine yards, then they get my wallet, they open it up. Oh, snap, this Eastman, he's an officer. Well, what do you do now? You've already tased me. You already threw me in the car. Now you got to go with it. It's over. It's all on videotape. Everything's videotaped. They take me to jail. They book me in our place. They let me out. Goes to the, the, the DA on Monday. They see what the deal is. Three eyewitnesses denied charges. Now you got a lawsuit on your head. Now you got this because such and such, what they did is they suspend me. Instead of, they throw it out of court, they suspend me and they send it to Metro. They keep me on hold for eight months. Well, guess what? I got a contract to fight in pride. Well, guess what they won't let you do when you own, when, uh, when you own, because it's, it's um conditional. So they don't let me fight. That's the reason why I yeah, fight in pride. Yeah, but you get that money in the lawsuit. I, I tried to tell them I need the money for my defense. They wouldn't let me do it because you got to remember when you, the fighting is secondary employment. First is the job as a police officer. They have to. So if I had done it, I could have lost my job as an, as an officer. Cause you're on probation. I mean, you're not probationary. It's, it's conditional. So that's the reason why I couldn't fight in the pride. Mm -hmm. I always regret that. Cause I, I would have loved to have been able to fight in that last fight, but they wouldn't allow me to do it. That's a shame. Well, I, I I hope everything worked out with that. Oh yeah, I I sued him and got all my stuff back with a big smile, not a small. I did. I oh, yeah. so I, I got my kid back. <laughs> all right. So you and Rampage rematch, and we're gonna wrap up. You after Rampage, you say, "I'm gonna drop down to 185 pounds because you really have always been a smaller person in your fights." You go down to a weight that is lower than your senior year of high school. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, um, I walk around still right now. I'm 53, but I'm probably, I don't train the same way, but I'm probably maybe 9, 10% body fat right now at 215, 216. Like so, you and I, Miguel. <laughs> yeah, so when I'm training three times a week, 5%, 4% body fat is nothing at 215. Well, I haven't dropped that weight in so many years. So what I have to do is I have to strategically drop weight. I start my weight cut a month out. First thing I do is I cut the, the sugar and carbs first week. Second week, um, everything is grilled. No, no, um, no fried stuff. I mean, no, nothing fried. Everything is baked the whole nine yards. Cut the sugar. So you lose body fat, you you lose um, a little mass, you get within 10 pounds of your walking weight, you're about 10 pounds out over the month, and then you then you um you water, you, you cut water. So that's how I was able to make the weight. Um, but I would do it over a month, not that one week type of stuff. You do it a month out. So that was the way I was able to do it, you know. But the picture of me at my UFC fight pitcher, I look like I'm 205, but I'm actually 185. My uh, my UFC trading card, that's me at 85. It's not 205, but most people think I'm 205 in that picture. So just because you, you just ripped up and shredded like some nobody's business, it don't don't feel good. But you know, you do it the right way. You know, what was it like training with uh, Mark Lehman? Uh, Lehman was. Good dude, but oh man, I could tell you what his feet, his control with his feet. Well, his, he didn't have two two sets of hand. He he, it's like he had four sets of hands because his feet were ridiculous, like hands. They just, I mean, it was like suction cups. The dude just snatched you up, and he was ridiculous off the ground. You know what I'm saying? He just really was. It was a totally different ball game. But good dude, but you know, you know, sometimes people know. They pick their poison. You could be a real good grappler, but you know I don't like to get hit in the face. So it's a totally different ball game, you know. 
So, but yeah, he's a good, good, really good dude. This dude's innovative, you know, very, very innovative. And it comes from John Lewis, you know, keep it real. They just, they just think different. Their, their mindset is totally different than everybody else's, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. So you fight Rob Kimmins in the IFO, you win their title. I think you delivered a couple of uh, groin shots to him uh, from guard. And you finally get the call back up to the UFC. UFC 81. Ooh, am I frozen? No, you good. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, Miguel Durante, you've got a gangster disciple from the south side of Chicago meeting a Las Vegas correctional officer, Terry Martin. How are <laughs> yeah, the ways? Uh, um, <laughs> that, it was pretty, it, it, pretty, not not difficult at all um, because one of the things that you understand is like it, he's supposed to be a banger, but the one thing that I know about Muay Thai is you don't leg kick a banger. You know what you do to a person that's a banger? You head kick them. You know why? Because, because of the length difference. And if I head kick you and you try to punch, you have no defense. So you get knocked out. You don't leg kick a puncher. You head kick a puncher. Because think about it. If I swing at you and if I swing at you, I have to drop my hands to throw my punch. My length is going to, if you kick like you're supposed to, my length of my legs is longer than your reach for your punch. So if you don't block, you get knocked out. If you, if that, think about it. If I kick at your head, I have to block. If my hands are down and I don't block, I get knocked out. That's what you do. You see me, no leg kicks. It was all head kicks. That's what you're supposed to do to a, to a puncher. But I wasn't threatened by none of his punches and he might have been knocking everybody else, but it wasn't, you know, whatever, you know. So anyway. They, they, well, they had said, mentioned during a fight that it was as close to a brawl as they had ever seen when you two were at weigh-ins. Yeah, because sometimes people got to pump themselves up. For me, yeah, I don't get fascinated by names and stuff like this. I'm, I respect who I respect. And if you a gangster, you a gangster with it. But like I said, you still got to prove it. So it doesn't really make any difference to me about all that garbage. Like I said, and I'm from the neighborhood. My, you know, my the, the neighborhood I'm from, they was a red guys. You know what I'm saying? I don't have to say who they is, but you know, I come up in a red neighborhood. So I don't care nothing about no gangster disciples and no uh, vice lords and none of that kind of stuff because they're not in my neighborhood. I respect them, but it was Crips and Bloods and Norteños and Serenos and Paisas and Laotians and Mongs and, and uh, Border Brothers. So that's what I had to deal with, you know, dealing, dealing with them crazy Crips and Bloods and, and, and Laotians and the Mongs like you had in a, <laughs> a Gran Torino, you know what I'm saying? That's mm -hmm. what you're dealing with where I'm from. So so that's wasn't a big yeah. deal to me. And that type of attitude you see daily at work. Oh, yeah, normal. Man, but, but but when you're dealing with what you deal with at work, those guys are hard, and then there's guys with bullet holes like Terry Martin. Terry Martin had bullet holes. You had to know. Yeah, he did. In the back of yeah. your head, you got to have some legitimacy. Well, let me explain something to you. Where I worked at was a federal holding facility. We had Al Qaeda, we had mobsters, we had um. Uh, drug kingpins we had mafia mafia matter of fact i can tell you who the couple you ever see that movie you ever see the mafia cops those two cops from um new york that was working for the mob that was doing hits for the mob oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah we had those guys in there we had um those uh you ever seen on uh 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 bt the um black gorilla family uh the p we had quite a few of those Philly Mafia guys, when I tell you the cats that we dealt with, matter of fact, I can tell you what, our holding facility, when people used to mess up in Terminal Island in L.A., the mess up that the penitentiary got sent to us, to the jail. How you send the people in the penitentiary for messing up to the jail? That's what we had to deal with. So trust me, 
you you learn to respect and you keep yourself together. So I'm like I said, because them people don't have to play. When you're dealing with a person that's dealing with three death sentences, he has nothing to live, nothing to live for. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of crazy people that we had to deal with in a stupid little jail. So, I, you, hey, you, Marvin, you know? I I don't think people at home can understand how profound that statement is. When somebody, let's just call it life in jail, which many have, the way they live their life is so much different than everybody else. Like they're, the way they react to certain, a single syllable coming out of your mouth doesn't sound right. Man, brother, you're about to have a real bad day. Hey, discrimination in there. There's no racism like it is in a penitentiary. Yep. When I tell you. He's right. It's, oh, it's it's. Matter of fact, me and you could be childhood friends. Childhood friends grew up together. Let me tell you what's going to happen when we get to the penitentiary. You ain't sharing no drink with me. You ain't sharing no cigarette with me. You can't use the same toilet that I do. Guess what? You can't even same walk phone, through the same nothing. area. Yeah, exactly. And we could be because of your color. Yeah. And that's the truth. We could have grew up together, but guess what? You're going to make a choice when you get in there. That's how bad it is. Yeah. You ain't going to be so, sitting where the TV's at. You're going to be in the back. Yep. <laughs> right, yeah. sir. 100%. What size are them shoes? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 100%, man. Yeah, no, no doubt. <laughs> You, you know, why don't we close with, okay, Ricardo Rona, we, we covered. Um, Terry Martin, you finally get your hand raised. It was almost like the, the monkey off your back. Like the UFC burden has finally been lifted. How big of a relief was that? It was, but here's the catch. My manager tried to negotiate another five five to seven fight deal with the money and basically what ended up happening to us they said look we're going to give you drew mcfedry's you win this fight we'll give you a seven fight deal so i'm like okay supposed to be an easy fight at the end of my contract and when i tell you i only had two fights in the in the ufc where i think that there wasn't something wrong against Terry Martin against Rampage. Rampage won fair and square. He just won the fight. I didn't fight a good technical fight. My last fight with Drew McFedries. First punch. He throws the punch. You remember the John Jones thing where they their their fingers out? Oh yeah. They yeah. jab him with their fingers like this. You know what he does? Sticks his finger right in my eye, tears my retina. Ooh. First, first, he, he, I'm coming at him. He sticks his hands out, stabs me right in the eye, tears my retina. Watch the fight. Tears my retina. I'm talking about a full separation. Can't see it all. Gone. He gums, throws a couple punches. I can't see. I can't see the, tear, the retina's tear. He tries to do a jump knee to the face. I catch him. Pick him up in the air, and I slam him. While well, I slam him on the right side, which is the my left side, which is the side where the retina is tore. Can't see anything at all because the full retina is like a broken mirror. Ugh. He's socking me on the side of the face. I can't see. I can't see. They stop the fight. Fight's over. Supposed to sign a, a seven, five to seven fight deal after you win the fight. It was a it was supposed to be a gimme fight. So when I tell you. Nobody has worse luck than me in the UFC. And it, to anybody else, it would sound like uh, complaining. But after that fight and when it was said and done, I go to the doctor and they tell me, you probably won't be able to fight anymore. It's a wrap. It's a done deal. And I'm like, okay, well, I accept it. God, I've accepted. Got some prayer from my, my mother and my mother-in-law walk in there to get my surgery done. The main surgeon is booked up for six months to a year, so I have to get a relief surgeon. Whatever. Got to get my eye done. So pray. I'm sitting in the office. That surgeon, that, that the, his name is Dr. Hollyfield, renowned, world-renowned surgeon. He's backed up for, for, for six to eight months, bare minimum. 
happens to come in on his day off. Sitting in his office, sitting in the office, he walks by, sees my name on the chart when I'm sitting in there. And before that comes, my mother-in-law called me and says, Marvin, I prayed to God and God told me that your eyes are going to be better and you're going to be able to um, fight again. Oh, wow, thank you. Five minutes later, that surgeon walks in. Hey, Marv, how you doing? Such and such a senior surgeon. I see you have to get eye surgery. Um, it's my day off, but I want to know if you allow me to do your surgery. I was like, what? So, like, yeah. So, oh, oh, you sure? Here. I'm cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, he he he's booked up for six for six months to a year. He can't do it. So, what's the chance that he comes in on his day off and he does the surgery for me? So, so yeah, I was, you know. You know, I was just God. You know what I mean? Yeah, it just yeah, that's sure. just the way it was. You know. Well, well, let me make a little side note for Drew McFedries. If you take people with five fights minimum in the UFC, and you do knockdowns per minute over a fifteen minute period, McFedries has got the most in UFC history. Like Fed McFedries has got the touch of God. Like he can change your entire life by hit punching you. Um, you know, outside of the the eyes, the punches that he was landing were pretty hard. I mean, that guy's he's a heavy hitter. Yeah, I ain't taking any, but teach his own, whatever. But like I said, if you can't fight, if you can't see, you can't fight. So, no, that's it. you know, uh, um, and like I said, trust me, I don't give a damn what nobody say. Rampage chin is made out of brick and mortal. And I don't know about that feet or fight. I, I kind of, you can throw that out the game. But short of anything other than feet or, you ain't knocking Rampage out. And that's the bottom line. I need that dude in the face. I elbowed him all in the head. I did a jump elbow number 10 on top of his head. I beat the brakes off of him. You know who else beat the brakes off of him too? Um the kid that he lost to, the Brazilian guy in in um in Pride, Nino Wanderley. So. His... Who? Wanderley. No, I ain't talking about Wanderley. I'm talking about the other dude, the first dude that he lost to, Needy Mall in this uh, uh uh Brazilian dude. Um, his first time he fought him, he 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 he, he beat Rampage up pretty good. Needy Mall in the ribs and broke his ribs and knocked him out the ring. Um, God damn it, he was the UFC champion before too. Here. Um, but right, he I got it. I, I got it. Go on. I'll look it up. His name. Uh, uh, he's a Brazilian dude. He used to wear them old biker shorts. Um, Shogun. 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 Oh, you watched that fight? Yeah. Shogun well, put put the put, yeah. the put the damage on him. But what I'm saying is, you know, it is what it is. But like I said, uh, I don't know anybody that has a harder chin than that dude. That dude is well, ridiculous. I say we close with this, Miguel. All right, you mentioned Rampage Jackson. After you fight him in the UFC, you're trying to go to sleep in your hotel room. <laughs> right thing that took place? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they, uh, you know, you ever see, <laughs> have you ever seen a Malcolm X for, where he, he, he got pissed off? He pissed off the nation of them and they kept calling all night. Hanging up, calling on, hanging up, calling, hanging up, hanging, talking smack. Somebody was calling my hotel night all night, <laughs> calling, hanging up, talking smack. So, you know, it's just technique. I mean, just whatever. You know, it, it's <laughs> it, well, it's the room next know. to you was having a party, and you went over there and you told them to quiet down. Did I? Well, the guy was the guy in that hotel room was Frankie Edgar, and he said it scared the living shit out of him. Oh, he's really? like my entire hotel room. <laughs> Are you like, serious? Yeah, it was Frankie I... Edgar. Frankie had just made his UFC debut. They're all celebrating. He said Marvin Eastman was at my door pounding on it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. I, I thought you was talking about somebody because because somebody from Rampage's kept kept calling my and hanging up. I thought that's what you I didn't know that's bro. Oh my God. I didn't know that. I, I didn't honestly I didn't know that. That's crazy. You know, imagine this large gentleman that's <laughs> every bit of 220, you know, with about four percent body fat. 
angry yeah, at your door. Hey, I'll tell you, oh, Frankie's tough, but Fra even Frankie would have to think about it. You know what I mean? No, <laughs> funny. You know what's funny, though? That's funny. And, and if I ever seen him, I would tell him I'm totally sorry, and I didn't mean nothing no, by it. No, he but, was upset in your sleep. No, no. He hey, needs to say sorry. He was well, wrong. Just a hey, real New Yorker. May, maybe, but... That's you know what I I must have didn't realize it because I thought you was talking about somebody kept calling and hanging up the phone. Well, that may have exasperated it, but yeah, Frank Yeager's like, yeah, we had Marvin Eastman at the door. It was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, if you ever tell him, if you ever see him again, tell him I said I apologize, man. Uh, I meant nothing yeah. by it. I had no idea at the time, so you know that's that's new. That's something funny to me. You know what I'm saying? It's funny because. That's not my – I get a different mentality. I tell people now, they don't see Beastman. They see Marvin Eastman right now. I said, but every once in a while, somebody makes me bring out the Beastman and act a fool a little bit. But I try to keep that guy under lock, you know, and, and chain. You know what I'm saying? I did my time. It's for my kids and my guys to show – to um to showcase. You know what I'm saying? So it's cool. You know, it's really cool. And I appreciate you guys that you got enough love and respect for the – for the for the for the cast to put us down to be able to show some love, like I said, I, I'm totally 100 percent appreciative. You know, excellent, too, Marvin. Man. Thank you. It was great to meet Legend you. Legend of the sport. You spent so much time with us too. Hey, thank you much. Excellent. I appreciate it. You got my number. You guys got ever you, in town? Come and holler at me, okay? Well, Michael, we got Marvin Eastman in the books, and uh, that was a good one. Yeah, for sure, for sure. You know, nothing like starting off the new year right. You know, two and a half hours with a fighter that's into it. Um, with, you know, a lot of history in regards to, you know, what he's accomplished. So, I mean, it's good time to start out 2023, Miguel. Yeah, for sure. No, I, you know, I'd never met him before and I like him already kind of thing. You know, he was a um, down to earth guy. You know, at the end of the day, the blue collar work ethic, you know, from his youth. Kind of that, that you know people carries over family yeah. kind of like grown up in each other and raising the bar and stuff um, made him into a pretty good man. It's a pretty solid individual, um, and uh, we got into some stories. He told some good stories, you know, and, and some surprises there. And you gotta give the MMA credit some some credit. I never do. I try not to, but he got he got Marvin at the end with the Frankie yeah. Edgar story. He wasn't aware that it was. Um, Lightweight champion that he was uh future <laughs> future lightweight champion threatening him in his entire room actually <laughs> so yeah it's uh very good work there and uh definitely a guy I think he enjoyed it and uh that's what you know our bread and butter is getting these guys into their wheelhouse I also feel I think for a minute he thought I was Chris Lytle which is Yo, you know Miguel, a compliment. I'm sorry Chris God you didn't take Chris, think I'd be I'd, mad at Marvin if I were you. Yeah, think I'd, think I'd you kept your shirt on because for sure it would have fooled him at that point. Yeah, no, I could, I could fool him. I, I usually paint Chris's <laughs> tattoos on myself anyway just for the buzz. <laughs> so, all right, brothers. That was a good one. Went good. Happy New Year's. This will debut on Monday, so this is your New Year's treat. Marvin Eastman bringing it in. and uh, Like, share, subscribe. Like, share, subscribe. I know, I, Miguel, we have to say it because – Sometimes our audience just um, doesn't do those types of things. Yeah, and, um, like you could do, you could do like you know, a New Year's resolutions and stuff. Like for example, if everybody we, you know, when you're in your car and you see an internet cafe, just park, go in, open a new Gmail account, and go in and, and like, subscribe, and, and, and leave our videos running on there, and go out and go to the, and everybody do ten internet cafes. That's it. Really That'll help. Hey, 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 we're also getting um, on iTunes. People are leaving reviews. Uh, one of the people that left reviews, they're they're requesting a Dave Strasser interview, which I, I do it. I know, and there was also one online. Uh, Crowbar sent me a screenshot of somebody requesting Strasser online. It's probably the same person, um, but uh, probably Dave. <laughs> it's probably Dave. <laughs> <laughs> or Garrity, <laughs> right? Um, but I think we're overdue for Strasser. I'd like to get him on as well. I think he'd be fun. I've got, I think, I, I got him researched. I'm about like 80% done. I would only need about an hour, hour and a half to finish him. And uh, yeah, we got, 
2023 is going to be more of the same as 2022. Keep building, keep climbing, put things in the library, and uh, we're get we'll t-shirts coming, uh, ladies and gentlemen. When this airs, probably towards the end of the week, we're going to be hitting on our social media which episodes need timestamps. All of the vaults need them. And there's probably about 14 or 15, TJ Grant, Pete Williams included, um, that need timestamps done. Um, we're going to be giving free T-shirts for the people that post the timestamps in the comments. It doesn't mean, well, I can copy and paste the timestamp ahead of me and post it here and pretend like I did it. Doesn't work that way. There's a whole bunch of episodes that need it. There's probably about 20, actually. Um, and, and our regular posters, like Vegan Higgler, Dude, we got you. Scotty Y, DeVry's Town. DeVry's Town, the shipping on your T-shirt's going to murder me, but it is what it is. You guys are loyal posters, so we got you guys covered. So, Miguel, excellent Our episode. Is in the Great books. job, buddy. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.